those who are joining us, uh, will you please occupy these seats in the middle? Let us fill up the middle spaces to allow those who join later to take to the back seats. Ushers, may I kindly request that you usher the people to the middle seats. Our guest of honor is with us and she will be joining us shortly. That is uh, Mrs. Esther Kalimzo. From where I am standing, I can see her and the team that is helping her in. Ushers, please um, let us have those people who are still standing move to the middle seats. Thank you. This is the long-awaited day when Makere University celebrates in a special way the life of one of our vice chancellors, indeed the first one, Frank Kalimzo. I see a very big team joining us right now. Mrs. Esther Kalimzo, our guest of honor, has just been part of a team that has completed a very big event at a central teaching facility that will henceforth be called the Frank Kalimzo Central Teaching Facility. This is the day indeed that the Lord has made. Okay. You're all most welcome, uh, those who have just joined us. Thank you, ushers. And again, let us sit them appropriately. I see we are joined by Professor Aaron Mushenjezi, the Vice Chancellor of Uganda Christian University. Mukono, we welcome you. Professor Kamatenesi, you're most welcome as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Performing Arts and Film. And now, uh, may I request us to stand up in recognition of our guest of honor, 
who is now walking in, Mrs. Esther Kalimzo. We welcome you to Makere University. We welcome you to this special event. We welcome you to this memorable time in our history, a day that we shall chronicle and remember for many years to come. We shall remember those footsteps you're making as you join us. We shall remember the reason you're here and the reason we are all here. We shall remember the legacy of Frank Kalimzo. We shall remember your own contribution to his life and his deeds. We shall remember the University Council and Management for this uh, recognition of an outstanding Vice Chancellor of Macquarie University. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Esther Kalimzo is coming from a very big event at the Central Teaching Facility. We usually, we initially used to call CTF1, that has today been renamed the Frank Kalimzo Central Teaching Facility. We welcome you. Thank you for opening that facility. It's a very big one. It's a four-story building. It's, it is fully equipped with lecture rooms, and fully equipped we mean there is furniture, there are the smart boards, there is an e-learning laboratory, there is a lounge to it, it's a very spacious facility, and that is how big Makere has chosen to remember Frank Kalimzo in that building. She makes her way. And I'll tell you, she's dressed in some of the Macquarie University colors. There's red, there's green, there's black. Great choice. Yes, uh, performing arts and film will now lead us um, in the national anthems. So I request us to remain standing so that we complete that part of the program and then proceed. Uh, as, 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 as by the rest of it. You're most welcome once again, Mrs. Esther Kalimzo, our guest of honor today. Yes, thank you very much. She has waved to us. Thank you. We acknowledge uh, that greeting. Yes. Uh, All right, over to you, Milton, uh, for the anthems. In the order of the Uganda anthem, the East African anthem, and the Makere University anthem, I'll bait in brief. Those who are able to stand, will you please uh, keep to your feet? If you're unable, um, perhaps you will raise your hand. I think those are the, 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 the rules of the anthems, not our rules. With the exception of our guest of honor, the rest of us who can stand, we, shall we please rise to our feet? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Oh, you
Thank you very much. Thank you for performing Arts and Film. Uh, Dr. Atam Suza and Mil Dr. Milton Waviona, we appreciate your enthusiasm, your energies, and that wonderful uh, setting us off with the anthems. May I now call upon, um, we want to have a prayer. Let me call upon the chaplain, Reverend Onesma Sasimwe, to please come and hand over this day and this event into the hands of the Lord. Thank you. Shall we bow in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you today. Indeed, this is the day you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for, the, for this very important event, the inaugural Frank Kalimuzo Memorial Lecture, that we can come together to commemorate, to think of, to remember a man you greatly used in this country in, 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 civil, in civil service and as a vice Chancellor, the first Vice Chancellor of Makere University as a national university. And for his great contribution in the few years, just a couple of years, 
that he served here in that capacity, but you used him greatly, that even when he's long gone, he still speaks through his works, through his legacy, a man who walked like the elephant, whose footprints are indeed indelible. We thank you for his dear wife, Mama Esther Kalimzo, and the children and the grandchildren. Thank you for sustaining them in this very difficult time without a husband, without a father, without a grandfather. You have been faithful. And we thank you for the University Council chaired by Mrs. Lona Magara for that visionary leadership that, Lord, they could think of renaming CTF1 after this great man as a way of immortalizing his contribution uh, to this university. And so we pray that this will be one way of uh, enhancing and consolidating healing, emotional healing to Mama Esther and the family. And that, Lord, this day will unfold with your presence. Bless every activity. We thank you for the members of the council present. We thank you in a very special way for the right honorable Dr. Ruhakana Rugunda, his dear wife, for uh, the right honorable Dan uh, Kidege, who is chair to MAC at 100 organizing committee and the members. We thank you for the vice chancellor, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, and other members of top management. For the guests present, we thank you for the keynote speaker, uh, Professor Joy Kwesiga. We pray that, Father, we will behold the glory of God, that, that somehow you will give us the, the strength, particularly Mama Esther. We know that this can be an emotional moment, but we pray that as we commemorate this hero, that we will look, we will focus on the positive things that he contributed as laying a firm foundation uh, for this university. Thank you that we are alive to witness Makero University celebrate 100 years. And so, Lord, bless this event, uh, bless every talk, bless the moderator and every conversation. Let it be for the glory and honor of your name. And we pray these mercies in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen, indeed. Thank you very much uh, for that prayer, our chaplain of St. Francis Chapel. Thank you very much. Yes, I would now like to call upon the Right Honorable Dan Chidega, Chairperson Makere at the 100 Organizing Committee. But before you come, uh, something spectacular happened here yesterday when one of the family members walked into Makere University on an entirely different mission and she happened to have stumbled across a team that was putting together the wording for the now Frank Kalimzo Central Teaching Facility. In that shock, in that moment, she could not hold herself and she broke down. Phyllis, come tell us what happened in a minute or two. The people who saw you recorded it and shared with many of us to say, if the University Council doubted their decision to name CTF as Frank Kalimzo, then your breakdown should make them realize that they made the right decision. Come, Phyllis. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Phyllis Kalimzo, second-born daughter of late Frank Kalimzo. Uh, this is a great honor. I thank Makere. Uh, briefly, um, yesterday, uh, I went through this university. I wanted to see uh, the, where the building was. And I passed by the building and realized it was just actually across from the road that we used to take going home. And uh, to see the name Frank Kalimzo on a building, it was our wish. It has happened. We are so grateful. And it's an honor. Uh, I think the name, you can see it's 50 years on. The name has um, almost, it was forgotten. Maybe the youth don't even know that there was a Frank Kalimzo here. He was here. He was a very hardworking man, loving father to us. And I cannot explain, when I saw the building, like she said, something came, everything that happened then, because I was 11 years old, whatever happened then came rushing back. And uh, it was very emotional for me. I thank God. I went back home crying. My mom said, now you're crying. I thought we're supposed to be strong in this. I am strong now. It's good I came yesterday, because right now I'd be a wreck. <laughs> so I'm so grateful that dad's name can be there, and it's, it's implanted now in the history of Makere. It was like almost erased, and this is great. Thank you, Makere. I'm so grateful. The family is grateful. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Phyllis, for sharing that. And uh, now I call upon, yes, the right Honorable Dan Chidega, Chairperson Makera 100 Organizing Committee. Another round of applause for our council and management for that decision. Thank you. Thank you so much. With your permission, may I kindly remove my mask for ease of audibility? Our guest of honor, Mrs. Esther Kalimazo, and members of the family, the Prime Minister Emeritus, Republic of Uganda, and Special Envoy for Special Duties, Office of the President, Right Honorable Dr. Rakana Rugunda, the Chancellor, Mountain of the Moon University, Professor Edward Rugumayo, the Chairperson of Council, Mrs. Lona Magara, our leader, members of the University Council, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Banabas Nawangwe, members of the University Management, our keynote speaker, the Vice Chancellor, Kavali University, Professor Joy Kwesiga, distinguished stakeholders, ladies and gentlemen, protocol observed. On behalf of the Makere University Organizing Committee, it gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to the fourth Makere at 100 lecture series in honor of a distinguished and truly patriotic Ugandan, the late Frank Kalimz. We are indeed humbled as Makere at 100 organizing committee that on this historic occasion to be joined by Mrs. Esther Kalimz and members of the family. Please join me, colleagues in welcoming this great family. A round of applause, please. In a special way, I would like to recognize the presence of the Prime Minister Emeritus, the Right Honorable Dr. Rakana Rugunda, and Professor Emeritus Edward Rugumayo. Thank you 
distinguished statesmen for accepting our invitation to speak as panelists at this special occasion in the history of your alma mater. Our chief guest, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, on the 9th October this year, the President of the Republic of Uganda and Vista of Makere University, His Excellency, Yuri Kaguta Museveni, officially flagged off the year-long celebration commemorating 100 years of impactful existence of this great university. This flag off happened on the, the sidelines of the 59th Independence Day celebration of our beloved nation at Kololo. Following the flag off by His Excellency, the President, on the 25th November 2021, we held a stakeholders mobilization event at which we appraised our alumni, staff, students, and various partners on the activities lined up to commemorate centenary celebration on the same occasion. The Vice Chancellor ably explained all our plans to fulfill our centennial theme, leveraging a hundred years of excellence in building a transformed society. Indeed, since then, we have held three public lectures delivered by distinguished personalities to help us unpack the various themes. The first Macquarie at 100 public lecture was on the theme, a legal perspective on the role of governing councils in the management of higher education institutions was delivered ably on the 9th February 2022 by a gallant alumnus and attorney general of the Republic of this great nation, Honorable Kiriwa Kiwanuka. This was followed on the 28th April this year by a second Makere at 100 public lecture in honor of our gallant alumnus, Guild President, great scholar, seasoned economist, and a long-serving governor of the Bank of Uganda, Professor Emmanuel Tumsime Mtebile. May his soul rest in peace. The lecture on the theme, Economic Recovery, Resilience in Post-COVID-19 World, the Role of Higher Education, was delivered by the Secretary, the, by the Permanent Secretary of Finance, Planning and Economic Development and Secretary to the Treasury, Mr. Ramadan Gobi. On the 6th of this year, of the 6th May of this year, we once again gathered in this very auditorium to listen to the Katikiro of Buganda Kingdom, which Tiba Charles Peter Maiga delivered the third Makere at 100 public lecture on the theme revisiting the life of the late Katikiro Sibiru in the lenses of Makere at 100 years, the contribution of cultural institutions in engendering the public goods. On the same occasion, we were privileged to have the late O.H. Tiba, Martin Luther, and Sibiru's surviving children, Honorable. Roda Kalema made a moving tribute to the people who are in the house. We thank her for that moving tribute. This morning, our chief guest, distinguished panelist, ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered here to listen to another distinguished alumna, Professor Joy Kwesiga, who will deliver the fourth Makere at 100 lecture series in honor of our Ugandan Vice Chancellor, the late Frank Kalemizo. Our theme, proudly displayed on the various material around this room, is remembering, I repeat, remembering Frank Kalemizo. Lessons for universities. 
in cultivating a culture of service and distinguished leadership. This theme was carefully chosen. By holding this public lecture, we not only celebrate his life and contribution of these great personalities, but also provide a platform for our stakeholders to discuss and forge a way forward on how best the lessons from their lives can be used to improve our university and indeed the nation and Africa as a continent. Further, the annual na nature of these lectures will act as a relying point for our staff, students, stakeholders, the general public to proffer solutions various to the various challenges through intellectual discourse and various approaches that the different characters can bring to this great university. I therefore thank you all our distinguished guests for honoring our invitation to attend this event and wish you a fruitful, memorable day. With your permission, I take this opportunity to request all members of the organizing committee where you're seated, please raise your hand for recognition and thank you for the great work you're doing. Please raise up your hand. I thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for listening to me. Thank you and we thank you too for leading such a team uh, that has seen that today is celebrated in such a big way. Yes, in our midst, we, have, we also have, in addition to the people you, uh, that Honorable Chidega has highlighted, we also have uh, His Excellency Joseph Rutabana, Ambassador for Rwanda. You're most welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. We have Professor Aaron Moshenjezi, Vice Chancellor of Uganda Christian University. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have uh, Professor Maud Kamatenesi, Vice Chancellor, Bishop Stewart University. Thank you for joining us. We have retired Justice Patrick Tabaro. Yes. Thank you uh, for joining us. He's, he is uh, the Chair of Macquarie University Staff Tribunal. We thank you. We have Justice. Augustine Shimia, Justice of the Supreme Court. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we have Madame Allen Kajina, Executive Director of UNRWA. Thank you. Uh, when some people see you, they say girl power. <laughs> we thank you for joining us. And we are told there is a very special um, uh, f family that is very close to the Kalimzos, Adrian Sibo, and your dear wife. Adrian Sibo, thank you, thank you. We are told you're very special to the family. Yes, let's continue with our program. I'm now going to call upon uh, Professor Barnabas Nawangu. Have you ever imagined, and God forbid, that you're seated in your office and the team comes to pick you up? As you give your remarks, I want you to imagine that moment that um, the late Frank Kalimzo went through. We have learned that he kind of knew he had already received threats, yet he did not waver. He said he was innocent and he will continue serving the country. Come tell us insights on why this lecture. You know how beautiful your office is, those red seats, red carpet, what? Then some people come, I don't know, wearing red what, and then they pick you. But yes, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Bana Basnawangwe is our Vice Chancellor. don't know what the, uh, <laughs> Marion you mean. <laughs> yeah. 
but that's not a prophecy, I hope. <laughs> Our guest of honor, Mrs. Esther Kalimozo, and members of your family, the Prime Minister Emeritus of the Republic of Uganda, and Special Envoy for Special Duties, Office of the President, Right Honorable Dr. Hakana Rugunda, and my OB, and your dear wife. He's my OB, it, it, it is okay to clap. <laughs> the Chancellor, Mountains of the Moon University, Professor Edward Rugumayo, the Chairperson of Council of Makere University, Mrs. Lona Magara, and your dear husband, Dr. Magara, the Vice Chairperson of Council, Right Honorable Danny Kidega, members of Council, our keynote speaker, the Vice Chancellor, Kavali University, Professor Joy Kwesiga, my colleagues, the Vice Chancellors of Bishop Stuart University and the U Uganda Christian University, the Deputy Vice Chancellors and members of management and staff of Makere University, representatives of government, ministries, departments, and agencies, representatives of the development partners, NGOs, and civil society, Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Rwanda to Uganda, students, distinguished guests, ladies, and gentlemen. I warmly welcome you all to the inaugural Frank Kalimzo annual public lecture and the fourth discourse in the Makere at 100 lecture series. In a special way, I welcome you, Mrs. Esther Kalimzo, and members of your family back to your home, Makere University. Thank you for sparing the time to join us this morning as we celebrate the life and legacy of Frank Kalimuzo, a distinguished Ugandan public servant and the first vice chancellor of Makere University as an independent national university. I equally welcome our gallant alumni, Right Honorable Dr. Hakana Rugunda and Professor Edward Rugmayo, back to your alma mater. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker today is no stranger to Makere University. She is a distinguished alumnus and a renowned gender and women advocate and mentor. She served Makere since graduating in 1967 until her retirement in 2004. Her early career service as the Vice Chancellor's personal secretary enabled her to witness firsthand Frank Kalimuso's work as Vice Chancellor, and we look forward to learning more from her keynote address. Obviously, as we have already said, she is now the Vice Chancellor of Kavali University. Thank, thank you, Professor Kwesiga, for accepting to deliver this important lecture. As Makere celebrates 100 years of existence and the excellent service to humanity, the university found it fitting to recognize the contributions of distinguished men and women who built the strong foundation on which the university continues to offer excellent service to humanity. And I would like to thank the University Council most honorably for this very important decision. <laughs> the late Fra Frank Kalimuzo was a distinguished Ugandan public servant and a pioneer in many firsts. He served as the first head of public service, first Ugandan secretary to the cabinet, and the first permanent secretary office of the prime minister, among other notable positions. His remarkable devotion to work and patriotism remains engraved in the core ethos in the university's leadership over years. Frank Kalimzo is a matter of higher education, for I personally believe that he lost his life in defense of academic freedom at Makere. And here, let me take this opportunity to say what academic freedom is. The concept of academic freedom is both this is an American uh, definition, the American Society of Teachers. The concept of academic freedom is based in the idea that the free exchange of ideas on campus, mark you, on campus, 
is essential to good education. Specifically, academic freedom is the right of faculty members acting both as individuals and as a collective to determine without outside interference the college curriculum, course content, teaching, student evaluation, and the conduct of scholarly inquiry. Academic freedom ensures that colleges and universities are safe havens for, in for inquiry, places where students and scholars can challenge the conventional wisdom of any field in art, science, politics, or others. But academic freedom is not about the freedom for students to riot or for lecturers to use vulgar language, as has been often thought. That is called academic thuggery. <laughs> At the time of Frank Kalimuzo's martyrdom, academic freedom was a strange phenomenon to the regime at the time, and hence it could not be tolerated. Prior to this public lecture, we held a simple function at which we unveiled the Frank Kalimuzo Central Teaching Facility, renamed in recognition of the sacrificial service of our first vice chancellor. We pray that this act of immortalization will preserve his legacy for countless generations to come. Our public lecture today aims to draw from the late Frank Kalimzo's service to offer lessons for universities in cultivating a culture of service and distinguished leadership. This is an important topic for our universities that are increasingly being relied upon to provide innovations responsive to various national challenges in the midst of limited resources and various geopolitical factors impacting our economies. We therefore look forward to listening to your keynote address, Professor Kwesiga, as well as the wise words of our distinguished panelists, Right Honorable Rohakana Rugunda and Professor Emeritus Edward Rugumayo, and the other discussants that will follow. I once again welcome you all to Macquarie University and wish you good listening as we build for the future. Thank you. It is now my honor and great privilege to request Mrs. Esther Kalimuzo to address us. Emotional day, you will forgive me when um, I'm not stable, but I thank God for this day.
the Chancellor Makere University, Professor Ezra Suruma, the Chairperson of the Makere University, Council Mrs. Ilona Magara and your our friend, Dr. Magara. The Vice Chancellor of Makerere University, Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, and your, your, your friend. The Vice Chancellor of Kabari University, Mrs. Joy Kwesiga, my friend. Dignitaries present, students and the staff of Makerere University, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I greet you all warmly on this momentous occasion on behalf of my family and myself. Please permit me to express my gratitude to God. I thank the Vice Chancellor Professor Barnabas Nawangwe and the entire Makerere University administration for deciding to set aside a day to remember the service of my husband. The late Frank Karimera Karimuzo, even though it has been many decades since he was taken from us, many years ago, our family organized a memorial service for him, at which Canon Bikangaga was the guest of honor. In his speech, Canon John Bikangaga told the congregation that Frank Memorial was too big for the family, for our family and should be done by either Makerere University or the government of Uganda. Since we had no power as a family to influence either of the institutions that he suggested, we had no option but to wait and see whether it would be proposed. We are extremely grateful that the administration of Makerere University has chosen to recognize Frank's service to the institution during this centenary celebration. In the course of the morning, multiple people who worked with my husband will tell us about what it was like to work with him. My contribution will be to share some personal memories which will introduce him to the many who were too young to have met him. I met Frank Karimzo in Rwanda in 1956 when he and a few other people from Uganda were invited to attend the Jubilee celebration of King Mutara Rudahigwa. At the time, my father, Reverend Elisa Wahungu, was serving as a, a semis missionary there in Butare, in Rwanda. I will not share with you the secret of how he proposed. <laughs> and all what we went through. But suffice to say that by 1957, he was planning our wedding. <laughs> and fortunately, in that year, he had a terrible car accident in which he was badly injured he came to Mulago and he was treated with physiotherapy and uh, excellent health care. Frank recovered well from his injuries 
Our wedding took place on 4th October 1958 in St. James Cathedral, Ruharu Mbarara. I don't know whether some were there or your parents were there. He was working in Mbarara as ADC at the time. Three months after our wedding, Franco was promoted to serve as establishment officer in the colonial government headquarters in Entebbe. He was in charge of recruiting Africans to repress colonialists. We lived in Chambogo at the time and met many Ugandans in our neighborhood who had recently returned to the country from their studies abroad. Our first child, Annette, was born in 1959. And shortly after that, Franco was posted to Kitgum as Uganda's first African assistant district, district commissioner. Here, I'm not very sure, either it continued as ADC or it was, um, they were moving like that. Um, while in Kitgum, he was also working as secretary to the World Committee. The purpose of the committee was to go around Uganda asking people how they would like Uganda to be governed. In 1960, our second child, Phyllis, was born. He was a maturity, this guy is a maturity, isn't it? <laughs> we were then in, in Kitugu Mustiro. In 1961, Franco was posted back to the colonial government headquarters to Entebbe, and we moved to a home there. In 1962, our third child, Rosalind, was born. She lives in the USA. When Uganda attained independence on October 9, 1962, my husband was appointed first permanent secretary in the president office and a secretary to the cabinet. He served as head of the civil service until 1970. During that time, we had three more children. Grace was born in 1963. Daniel was born 1965. And Paul was born 1967. One day, at the end of 1970, we were attending a tea party at Nakasero State House. When President Milton Oboti announced that he had appointed Frank Karimzo as the Vice Chancellor of Makere University, it was a shock to everyone. I remember we all kept quiet. My husband took up the new appointment in 1971, and we moved to Makere. A few months after we moved to a, a few months after we moved to Makere, there was a military coup. The following year, as Makere was preparing for the Jubilee celebration, some men came to the vice uh, chancellor's residence and told us that they had been sent by government officials to take Frank. They took him away, and he was never to be seen again. Even though we had witnessed Frank being taken away by these, um, my daughter said gentlemen, by these men, <laughs> neither radio of Uganda 
no UTV, mentioned anything about it in the subsequent weeks. Three months after Frank had been taken, I went to see Minister Edward Rugumayo. God bless your soul, Minister Rugumayo. I went to see Minister Edward Rugumayo to see if he could give me any information about the disappearance of my husband. Minister Rugumayo informed me that someone from Makindye Barracks had told him that Frank was killed on the same day that he was taken from the vice chancellor's house. He advised me not to ask anyone else about the matter and urged me to go and take care of my children. At the time, the eldest of our six children was 13, and the youngest was five. By the grace of God, our family moved from the vice chancellor's residence to a house in Nakasero. For many years after we moved, we continued to hear stories that Frank managed to escape but none of the stories has even been confirmed. Our lives have been, never been the same since Frank was taken from us. We continue to miss him dearly. Through his hard work, Frank blessed many people around him giving hard-working people promotions and helping young people with school fees. By the time he died, Frank was paying school fees for 22 children on top of his own. He helped many people to find jobs and cared for so many. I call this gift of love, respect, and humility, gift from God. He did his best to improve the lives of the Rwanda refugees who were in, camp in camps, including finding good, good and clean water and land for their settlement. Frank's gift of communication also helped him to make many friends from all walks of life, whether they were rich, poor, kings, or ordinary people. He had a great sense of humor and was able to communicate in several Ugandan languages. After it became clear that Frank would not be returning to us, my main prayer was that my children be educated and by God's grace and miracles, all my children were educated up to university level. I have seen, since been blessed with the sons and where am I? <laughs> and daughter in Rose, eleven grandchildren and five great grandchildren. <clears throat> we give God all the glory. My humble appeal to the new generation is that we continue to pray for Uganda, to have leaders who fear God and respect for one another. Men will also pray 
And may we also pray for a society that values life. Because up to now, we still hear stories of premature death. May God have mercy on us all and continue to take care of widows and orphans. And may the Lord bless you all for listening to me. Thank you very much, Mrs. Esther Kalimzo, for that moving tribute. We also recognize that in 1980, you gave your life to Christ, after which you spent the rest of your life serving the church, and your most recent position being chairperson, seniors ministry, and intercessors at All Saints Church Cathedral, Nakasero. We thank you for that service. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, Shall we take our seats and prepare to receive our distinguished speaker, Professor Joy Kwesiga, Vice Chancellor Kabale University. Professor Joy Kwesiga has been a professor of gender studies and vice chancellor at this university since November 2005 to date. She oversaw the transformation of Kabale University from a private community university to a public university in 2015 and effectively steered it to attain an operating license in 2005 and the university charter in 2014. We thank you for that addition to the number of uh, public universities in the country. Previously, Professor Kwesiga served at various levels as a university administrator at Makere University. There we say, Emakeroye. Emakeroye. Muliwa. Emakeroye. So we thank you for coming back home, Professor Kwesiga. And we also congratulate you for rising from the ranks of Deputy Academic Registrar to the Academic Arena, serving as the Head of Department for Women and Gender Studies. Uh, we, our, our Dean is here. We shall see Professor Sarah Sari. Uh, Professor Kwesiga is one of the people who laid a foundation for where you are now. She later became the Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences. Professor Kwesiga was the founding head of the Gender Mainstreaming Division. Uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Izobi, are you here? Yes, yes. So, again, she laid a, a firm foundation for you there. And, um, and of the Academic Registrar's Department at McCarran University, uh, Mr. Alfred Namoa, are you here? Yes. You see how they have come to support you? Professor Kwesiga, your people are here. Yes, they are all here, and they are, that means they acknowledge your, your efforts. She was the Deputy Chairperson of the Executive Committee of the Inter-University Council for East Africa from 2018 to 2021. She has been a member of the Uganda National Council for Education. Uh, do we have representation from National Council for Education? Hey, somebody had better call them quickly. She was the vice chairperson of the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum. All VCs in the house, thank you for coming um, from 2015 to 2017 and still serves on its executive committee. Professor Joy Kwesiga is a founder member of Action for Development, a national women's rights organization that resuscitated the women's movement in Uganda during the 1980s and 1990s. She was involved in the formation of the Forum for African Women Educationists, among other CSO organizations. We thank you. She has widely researched into Uganda society and has published in the areas of equity in education, gender studies, Professor, uh, Dr. Izobia, there you are, the African women's movement, civil society and management, there's a very strong urge for women now. So when you hear that these people have published, you know that they laid a firm foundation for us to stand confidently and talk. We know that uh, you've, you've done a lot of work. We thank you, we celebrate you. Professor Joy Kwesiga has won many national awards in recognition of her work, focusing on equity in education, social science research, promotion of girls' education, women empowerment, service to the community, Uganda Independence Medal, a national award for personal integrity. That's very important. You're most welcome to give your speech, uh, your keynote address to us this morning. Shall we receive her? Thank you very much.
Thank you for the introduction. Thank you very much. Mrs. Esther Kalimuzo and family of the late Frank Kalimuzo, the Prime Minister Emeritus of the Republic of Uganda, Right Honorable Dr. Rwakana Rugunda, and your wife, the Chancellor of Mountains of the Moon, Professor Edward Rugumayo, whom we have seen for years as, as a mentor, The Vice Chancellor, I should start with the councils, the chairperson of the council, and if there is any other council chair here, the Vice Chancellor of Makere University, Professor Nawangwe, fellow chancellors, Vice Chancellors here present, and distinguished guests because I see many faces. I won't to be able to recognize you all, but I do recognize you. And as the person who introduced me said, I see many colleagues and I recognize you all, ladies and gentlemen. First, it's always a pleasure to return to Makere University, where I entered as a student in 1964. He said, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and stayed on as an employee since statutory retirement. I came in as a student and remained in Makere University, worked through I always say I recycled myself through many offices in Makere University up to the time I left as a professor. I left Makere in 2005 to go and serve in Kabale University. And I say as a way of introduction that I'm actually a good case study for Makerere's staff development program because I started from the very bottom and went through it. I'm grateful for that. It is their fine honor to have been requested to be keynote speaker on this important occasion when Makerere University pays tribute to its first vice chancellor, the late Mr. Kalimuzo. I commend you, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Nawangwe, and the preparatory team for the centenary for making arrangements to have this series of, re of lectures to recognize those who contributed to building Makere University. I'm appreciative of the Kalimuzo family, led by Mrs. Esther Kalimuzo, who thought that I would be the most appropriate person to talk about Frank Kalimuzo today. I thank you very much for that, and uh, I think uh, I, I have some knowledge about Frank Kalimuzo. So thank you for doing this. I would like to add my appreciation to Makere University, which the family has already expressed, the recognition you have already made about naming the central teaching, teaching facility after Mr. Frank Kalimuzo. A large part of this audience may not know, uh, and our dates tend to not to match with Mrs. Kalimuzo's dates, but I became the personal secretary of Mr. Frank Kalimuzo in 1970, about September, till he disappeared. He had reported for duty a few months earlier. At that time, I was privileged to be in the UK, uh, uh, just going around universities to gain university administration experience. 
that when he came to take over, I think it was through fear of change, the long-serving personal secretary of previous principles, who was British, decided to leave suddenly. She resigned. But then Mr. Karimzo heard that there were people training. Uh, abroad we could come, there were two of us. So I was recalled very fast to come and take over that job. So in light of the above, when I received Professor Nawangwe's letter inviting me to, to deliver this lecture, I did not hesitate at all. I'm particularly happy to talk about the late Frank Kalimuzo because I have always felt that he really deserves more to be recognized more by Makerele than has been the case hitherto. And I'm glad that things are changing. <laughs> Yesterday, I met somebody whom I want, whose name I won't mention. <laughs> I talked to her, I said, I'll be in Makere tomorrow. I won't attend another function that is going on in the town. Then she said, hey, I saw that thing, but who was Kalimuzo? I said, you come and find out tomorrow. And I'm glad that person is here. <laughs> So I think we, need, we needed to give more attention and recognize him because he actually built, contributed to building Makere. And I hope that by the end of my talk, I will have demonstrated that although his service to Makere was brutally cut short, he laid valuable and strong bricks to the building of Makere University. So in order, since it is a long time, 50 years, and many, many of you would not know about Mr. Frank Karimzo and what he did, I thought it very important to give you the context in which he came here. You need to know the background, the context, how he came here and what was pertaining and the background to Makere University at the time. In analyzing the culture and service and distinguished leadership, which is the theme on which this lecture is premised, the prevailing environment becomes crucial because it influences processes and outcomes. I will therefore first focus on the environment under which Mr. Frank Karimzo was called to serve. I'm convinced that you need this information in order to appreciate his role. The history of Makere University has been demonstrated by many, including people like McPherson, Fale, and Watson. These were historians here in Makere University. Wandira, who was also who became vice chancellor thereafter. And the most recent comprehensive account is by Professor Sebufu who was also vice chancellor here. I hope you have had a chance to read that book. He actually gives a chronicle of Makere University, adding to what Professor McPherson had written earlier. So in this context, we need to take note that Makere College was for a very long time a college of the University of London, 1949 to 62 and then a constituent college of the University of East Africa, 63 to 1970. This had implications on, on, this, on the powers and abilities to innovate and to be independent. <clears throat> so the major concern at that time was that the special relationship between Makerere and University of London and later as a college of the University of East Africa could not provide the independence that is required for an African university. I'll give just a few highlights, things which were being debated at the time. There were wholesale limitations found in the college constitution. 
limitations tied to standards of entry in the name of preserving the gold standard. Gold standard was the measure of a, a university. Now we usually see ranking, but at that time they called it the gold standard. And gold standard was really measured by British or European universities. So there was that, that issue, we have to keep the gold standard. The second debate was about relevance to the needs of the country where the university was. And in 1964, someone who led a study here in East Africa, Ashby, emphasized that there was a, mis a mismatch because, and I quote, the pattern of university appropriate for Manchester, Exeter or Hull, was appropriate too for Ibadan, Kampala, and even Singapore. Because these universities were created on the, uh, just on the, the same framework as the University of London. So there wasn't a way to say, does this fit Makere University or Ibadan, which was also formed at the same time. The third area was the curriculum. And the curriculum had to be what the British or the British uh, professors thought should be the right curriculum. And here I, I, I cite the frustration cited by Watson and Fadi, whom I've mentioned earlier, quoting Professor Ali Mazuru in 1978. Uh, Professor Ali Mazuru explained how it was very difficult to teach political thinkers within the, the discipline of political science because they, they thought that would de derail the students. And he explains that even when they allowed them to teach Karl Marx, it was in the final year, one, one term, and the exams had to be vetted in London, the exam questions, so that they don't go astray. And also I remember when I was here as a young student, there were debates about, it, it took a long time to teach other types of literature because the, 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 the theme was, it was English literature. So these were debates going on. Makere University was culturally cut off from the rest of Uganda, and, and Professor Wandira in his book explains these issues of high table, wearing of gowns at dinner, the Latin grace before meals, and other English etiquettes. And I would like to quote what these writers have said about Makere University at that time. There were often criticisms that Makere produced an elite class of students in the 50s who developed notions of superiority, holding themselves aloof from struggles of their own communities, for they were, so, they, uh, they were assured of jobs paid at many times the rate at which their fathers had ever earned or could ever earn. Sir Alexander Saunders was one of the people who wrote, who used to, who con, uh, con, I think considered some of this higher education and wrote about it. And he said, this is now another argument, the opposite argument, he said it was necessary to have a highly selected highly trained men who became an elite of, in, of necessity and inevitably became isolated by their very attainments, interests, and mode of life, which was remote from their families and sometimes even remote from their wives. So and the, the other uh, thing that was observed that there were concerns that graduates of these, these universities, including Makerere, could graduate with an object, with, without an objective and scholarly understanding of the society from which they themselves had come. And here, as I, end, uh, I talk about that background, 
I'm reminded of a story we had when we were students here of a Makere medical student in Ankore. He used to put a sign post on a path going to his homestead, the father's homestead. Silence, Makere student reading. So apart from this isolation, you, you remember that this was a decade of independence among many African states. So there was this urge of building an African university. And uh, so many countries were getting their independence. So there were many conferences and meetings that, that thought about Afri the African university. And UNESCO itself in 1962 organized a conference just how to define an African university so that, as Ashibe said, it, uh, it was necessary in that in the cultural climate of a modern state, a new university cannot remain a first meal of the same foreign model. There were these things that were required. And I bring this background because this is how Mr. Frank Karimzo was selected to come and take over these debates. Uh, a writer also on African universities said African universities must be able to depart from that background and promote and disseminate knowledge which is locally produced. The other issue was that research must be that which affects the, the community, not just research by itself. Intellectual leadership should be geared towards socioeconomic developments of these countries. Modernization should include extension work and artisans and look at farmers. And of course there was Pan-Africanism. And there was an issue of also opening up to a wider group of students, what we normally call a move from elite to mass higher education. So as, uh, as we moved on, uh, I think it was necessary to look at the Ugandan scene as, as, the, the universe, as independence came in. And you remember that when Makere was, the, the relationship with the University of London ended, it became part of the University of East Africa. And as part of the University of East Africa, Makere's development was actually halted because Nairobi and Dar es Salaam were new, and it was argued that Makere needed to give space and that's why some of the disciplines could not be started. What was in Kenya couldn't be done in Uganda. So when the, 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 there was this issue of creating Makere University as Makere University, all these things played a role in the background. And so a visitation committee, the government visitation committee in 1970 decided the role of what Makere University should be. And uh, I won't go into the details of that, the results of that visitation committee. And I'm glad Professor Ugumayo is here as Minister of Education. He was very well aware of what was happening. But I want to, to cite a quotation from the report of that committee which also will introduce us to what the topic was of discussion, the work that was given to Frank Kalimzo. Another grave fallacy worthy of note is this clamor for international standards, which has distorted Makere's vision of the educational needs of this country to the extent that the staff teaching and research are dominated by foreign interests. Any attempt towards rapid Africanization of staff or orientation of the syllabuses and research towards the needs of Uganda has been frustrated by the outcry 
of standards will be lowered. We are satisfied that the standards of a university are judged not by the extent to which it can meet international competition folks, but by the degree to which its products can contribute to the common endeavor to solve the state and answer national problems. The visitation committee concluded that Makerere University had grown up as a university in Uganda, but not necessarily for Uganda. It was a state within a state. It was in this spirit that the Makerere University Act of 1970 was passed. It was answering to the shortcomings that had arisen a long, for a long period of dependency. It was answering to the new needs of an independent Uganda. Consequently, the state became present in the function of the chancellor, who now was the president and appointed the vice chancellor. The, prime, the minister of education had sweeping powers, including the appointment of deans and heads of departments, the appointments board was, was also appointed by the minister, mainly composed of politicians. The minister was responsible for appointment of professors and could decline to appoint them even when they had publications. And the last nail was fixed by this committee, and I quote, the minister may, if in his opinion, it is in the public interest so to do, give directions on any matter to a university authority as to the exercise of any powers and performance of any functions under this act. And the authority shall comply with such direct directives. So in a way, this act was answering to relationships between the university and the state. And I, I emphasize the relationship between the university and the state because Karimuzo came in as a link bet from, between the university and the state. And I'll go on emphasizing because the state did not feel part of Makerere. It was, there was that gap. So, so Previously, there was a cordial relationship between Makerere and the colonial government, the university, the corporate bodies, as well as religious leaders, because they were the same group, the British. This is how, to give you an example, this is how it could be possible for a bishop's wife in Namirembe, Mary Stewart, to take lead in successfully advocating for women to enter Makerere University in 1946. I don't think a bishop's wife now can influence to that level. <laughs> Similarly, therefore, the government of independent Uganda saw the need to influence matters at Makerere University. The ruling party had replaced the colonial establishment and from the perspective of the state, it had to take charge. The center of power for Makerere had changed. Lastly, we need to recall in this section, which I give as the context, and I have dwelt on it purposely, we need to recall that this was the time of the move to the left, guided by the Common Man's Charter. The Common Man's Charter, I hope, you, I hope some of you, if you, have, if, you don't, if you haven't read the Common Man's Charter, go to the Africana archives and read that document. It was supposed to lead Uganda had there not been the coup of uh, 71. And it was a strategy aimed at bringing about inclusiveness in society, as we say, leaving no one behind. The issue of privileges, such as that those which were enjoyed by Makerere, had to end.
a society that valued equity was to be built and the plight of the wananchi was to be to be made the focus so this drive was cut short by the coup but i think it had delayed the the, the, the whole purpose of inclusiveness and removing or reducing privileges so that is the context in which Mr. Karimuzo came to Makere University. And now I want to move to his first days at Makere University. It is usually said that 100 days for a top manager illustrates the kind of leader he or she is and the direction that person would like to take. And, and um, by this time, his, stand should, his or her stand should be known, and the people who are led should know what to expect. Let me digress here, Professor Nawango, and congratulate you. You made your 100 days very clear, the direction where you wanted to take Makere. When Mr. Karimzo was appointed vice chancellor, he was already an accomplished leader. In fact, a distinguished leader. He was one of the first African district commissioners. That was a very important job day, those days. A DC in colonial times had the powers, so that was a big job. Uh, they wielded a lot of power and great territory because the districts were big. Mr. Karimzo had already served as an establishment officer charged with the process of Africanization, as his wife has said, and training and placing uh, uh, Ugandans to replace departing British civil servants. He also became head of civil service, you know, the top civil servant. He was there for seen as the best person to, uh, by the appointing authority to take up the, first jo the role of first vice chancellor of Ka uh, Makere University. I was going to say Kavari University. <laughs> he was appointed the chancellor uh, by the chancellor, His Excellency Dr. Milton Obote, and he was expected to turn the university into a Ugandan university. Remember, the university was in Uganda, but not for Uganda. Unfortunately, he was welcomed with unprecedented resistance, great resistance. And in this section, I'll be frank, as his name says. He was not part of the academia. That was the first criticism because he came direct from civil service. You all know, maybe you all don't know, but it is clear. Academicians tend to treat administrators as morons. They think they don't know much. <laughs> I, I know these things have been in both worlds speaking from experience. They tend to believe that they know better. So some of them really hoped that he wouldn't manage. So as he started his work. So that is one of the areas of resistance. The second area was from those who thought a vice chancellor shouldn't be a political appointee because he was appointed by the president and as uh, uh, Madame has told us, it was announced at a party, so that was, uh, they said a, a political appointee is going to change things, and remember, most of the staff were expatriates in Makere at that time. So that was another source of resistance. Some people genuinely demanded for academic freedom that the Professor Nawangwe was mentioned, and they thought it was being got curtailed by st uh, state interference to be able to choose leaders and, and give them an agenda because they say you are going to make Makere a Ugandan university. Then, on, on the part of some Ugandans, including those I mean in Makere, 
both the all levels, administrative ranks, technical support staff. There were some sectarian tendencies, sectarian resistance. And this is where I want to be very frank. You would, you would be passing some corridors and, and the, the vice chancellor passes and they say, I think some of you will know what it means. Those who don't know will ask. <laughs> so that was the kind of resistance he came in to, to as he entered Makere University. Within no time, within a very short time, a student strike was organized as a protest, basically rejecting the vice chancellor. He managed to contain the, the strike because he was armed with this rich previous experience and dedication to duty as a civil servant. And in his inaugural addresses, he announced that he's going to change my career and he's going to work like a donkey. Those were the words it was heading in the newspaper. And from what I can surmise on what followed in his leadership trail, he laid strategies on how to move forward and transform Makerere. I want to, to confirm his, his son's experience. Of course, you wouldn't have found Mr. Karimzo. He was always in the office. So I, I really felt that you described the situation when you said I never got to see my father because he, was, he went early and he came early. Whenever we needed him, you said you would they would lead you to his office. The strategies that will, will demonstrate a unique leader, manager, and relationships builder from whom we pick lessons for the theme that the organizer was emphasizing. And I want now to take a few of those themes under which I, I assess his contribution so that you ca I can demonstrate his work. The first part is that it is, it is said, and I quote a Peter McCaffrey who has written about, about managing universities. His book is uh, 2019, it's British universities but attains to all universities. One, one area that I want to emphasize now is knowing your institution as a university leader. He went out to understand the institution. You remember there was resistance. So how did he do it? One, he quickly went out of his way first to understand the governing structures of Makere University. He spent many evenings in the office reading previous reports of significance. He went through records of council and senate. He often interacted with various members of management and rated, rated governing bodies. That was a way of getting to know the history. Second, he read and asked about developments and departments. Within a very short time, he was able to know who was an excellent performer and those who lagged behind. He quickly built good relationships with many members of staff, especially senior members of staff, and he was therefore able to have a general feel of what obtained at faculties and departments. Some people soon became very, very relaxed and they would come and give free information. The third way that he got to know his, this organization, he devised ways of re establishing rapport with the critical mass of the student body. He had, he had promised students that he would work with them to, posi to positively change the university. So many times he participated in student sports. I recall at one time students called, invited him to be the referee in inter-hall football matches. <laughs> he politely explained that he could not marshal the vigor and fitness required of a referee, 
but offered to be a linesman in two or so matches, and he did. Within a short time, students were able to voluntarily suggest ways improving, about improving student governance. The third example I give of how he, he came to know the university so quickly is through social dynamics of the university. During the Karimzo era, Makere University mainly was still a residential university. Most staff lived in university housing, and I can see my neighbors, the Mugambis there, where we used to be neighbors, uh, either on the hill here, somewhere in Kataremwa, or Kororo, or Makinde, or Kavanyoro on the farm. Social services to cater for sport and recreation and senior staff club were vi vibrant and social gatherings were common. Mr. Karimzo quickly made an entry into these social events. He would once in a while drop in the senior staff club, take a beer, but mainly converse with staff in their more relaxed mode that goes with a glass or two. You know what happens after two bottles. <laughs> then came the parties and dances in the main hall. These were common gatherings. These provided an inclusive arena where all levels of staff and sometimes students participated. It was not uncommon for us to find ourselves gazing at the tall frame of the vice chancellor as he waltzed across the floor of the main hall. This indeed became an icebreaker. With the above approach, Mr. Caruso was not only able to understand the institution he led, but I would say he simultaneously worked on managing change because he, was managed, he had come to cause change and sowing resistance blocks. Resistance to change is always an obstacle to progress, but Mr. Karimzo tackled this in a reasonably short time. This is a lesson for all of us leaders, not, not just university leaders. He was thus able to assert authority where there were efforts to fail him from the start. That was an area of knowing his institution. Then he also had this skill of knowing the wider environment apart from the university because the university has stakeholders. Apart from the state or the actual owners of the university, there are many stakeholders of universities and these are varied. Mr. Kalimzo keenly participated in, this, in the events involving sister universities in, East Af in the East African region, Association of African Universities. He attended meetings and conferences of the Association of Commonwealth Universities and the Commonwealth Secretariat. Within a very short spell of time, he had made an impression globally. He actually had been invited to be keynote speaker at an education conference that is periodically organized by the Commonwealth Secretariat. It's, it's a, a conference that is, takes place every two years, education conference of the Commonwealth. He had been invited to be keynote speaker uh, because of, uh, of what the impression he had given, but he was killed before that event. From him, we learn how important it is for the leader to try and identify with and fit in the community of scholars and academic managers and association. At the local scene, Mr. Karim's already had strong networks, just, uh, not just with the other agencies of government, but also within the business community. He knew and got on well with industrialists such as the Madivan family. It is through these connections that he initiated the purchase of the facility that became the university hospital. 
more details about this particular property can be found out, but I'm very much aware that he initiated the discussions here. Mr. Frank Karimuzo had rubbed shoulders with the legislators and other senior public workers, permanent secretaries, heads of parastatal bodies, and top officials. So it was very easy for him to pick up a phone and call any such officers whenever he needed to consult on issues concerning Makere. All the above required the application of tact and care. In other words, a diplomatic approach to issues. He combined all this with humor and charm and became a winner all the time. So he had this big network which helped him to move on. I now want to focus on the issue of leadership and management. Various scholars have distinguished between a manager and a leader Start, uh, starting with the analysis of Peter Drucker, who is a well-known management co uh, analyst, and who summarized the difference by saying that leaders do the right thing, managers do things right. There is a tendency to promote leadership, the leadership concept as opposed to management concept, but one needs to note that management is also very useful because it is result-oriented and we need both manage, the management, uh, uh, the manager and the leader concepts or skills. Uh, so I, I would like to pick a few from the wrong list which is given of a leader and explain how Mr. Karimzo used this to insert uh, or assert his leadership. One was the energy. What a leader has to be energetic. That is one of the qualities or the, the needed qualities. And I've already said he came to work as a donkey. I won't go in the details of that. Everybody talks about his hard work. He was an enabler. That was another issue. He would be able to, maybe because of his experience, he knew, for example, those of us who were in his office, he could tell the talent of each where there was weakness here, take you to an office or give you a short course where you could go and be able to improve yourself. So he was able to build these things and also to support and motivate staff. He gave me a telephone extension and those days, Macquarie University had one telephone exchange in the main hall, and the telephones were free. So I had an extension of the main one in the, in the house, and you could ring anywhere. You go through the exchange and ring. So there was a, a series of newspapers weekly talking about events in Macquarie University. We called them Yellow Pages. And one member wrote, say, how can a secretary get a telephone in, in her house when a senior lecturer has no telephone? And you called this person and explained to him what a secretary does. You know, I've already mentioned the relationship between administrators and academicians and what should be, and this person apologized. He, uh, the third area I would like to mention, he was a mentor and a counselor. He, ex he often explained to senior staff that they need to mentor their junior staff in the, if the university was to work efficiently. This was not just the staff around him. And I want to give an example of my husband, Professor Jesse Kwesiga. He once, as a young lecturer, wrote a letter to the vice chancellor complaining about something him and his head of department had disagreed about. Mr. Karimzo invited him to his office and gave him a lecture about the risks of the written word, <laughs> especially 
because it would be a permanent issue on his file. He also made it clear that in his judgment, he, Mr. Kwesga, was actually the one in the wrong. So he demonstrated, he told him that it's better to use talk to the person rather than write, rush to writing. He, des, he demonstrated that if he, Mr. Karimzo, insulted Mr. Kwesi Gavabari in the well-known, extremely crude Chichiga way, where men in particular swear by their mothers, there was no way he could be pinned down since no one else would have been present. But I'm sorry, I, by my upbringing, those obscenities won't come out of my mouth. <laughs> but people like the right honorable here will know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm unable to say those words, but Mr. Karimzo used them to drive home a point. Of course, these days they record you. That time, there was no time to, it wasn't possible. He admonished Mr. Kwesga, requested him to tear the letter there and then and go back to work. <laughs> From then on, Professor Kwesga, whom I know very well, became a very careful person, in fact, too careful about such matters. Mr. Karimzo was always providing similar help to students, especially when they disagreed with one another. I recall him taking off quite a bit of time to console the present day Honorable Jack Sabiti, in those days a student here, to the effect that in any election there has to be a winner and a loser, and that there were other areas in which he could lead. I think he was vying to be guild president uh, unsuccessfully. Now, this one, I didn't get permission from our chief guest, but I'm sure he will forgive me, but I'm going to talk about him. I recall when our chief guest of today was a very vibrant leader of the National Union of Students of Uganda, NUSU. He apparently caused the student strike in St. Leo's in Fort Potter. I, don't, I do not recall whether Honorable Dr. Wakana Rugunda was then on attachment as a, a medical student or whether he was on a student mobilization drive. The head teacher lodged a complaint in writing to the vice chancellor and actually made it clear he did not want to see that student again at his school. This, the student leader <laughs> was called in for discussion and since he left the office of the vice chancellor smiling, the vice chancellor must have advised him on how to lead without antagonizing head teachers. <laughs> he was an effective communicator. By the time Mr. Karimzo came to Makere, he already, as I said, he was already an accomplished leader. He communicated with utmost ease. One example I can give will suffice, and, and uh, I think Mrs. Karimzo has, said, has explained his book many languages. Could you speak Luo, because he had worked in Kitugu. He could speak Runyankwere. He could speak Ruchiga, because there is a difference. And he spoke very good Luganda. And of course, his mother tongue, Chifumbira. So he was able to communicate very well with other people. So this, this skill I like to demonstrate one day he came from a late lunch break and called him into his office so that we could prepare for graduation. And he started graduating, I mean dictating his the graduation speech. It took over one hour. I filled what we call short handbook, these handbooks. He was dictating almost two hours. So I had to sit and, and do the speech and 
it actually changed very little. This, this is the kind of skill you have. Just say this is what we are going to talk about, and he talked and finished the, the dictation. So he had very admirable skills in this area. And uh, uh, it is how he could manage to be able to lead, because they say you lead by example, and the community could see that he actually had skills and was a leader. So the resistance was sewing away because of his skills. And I want now to use my personal experience of mentorship because it's very important. So we are saying cultivating a culture of service. And this is how he was cultivating this into us, those whom he led and those who were close to him in, in this service. It would be a disservice to Mr. Karimzo not to put on record and appreciate the contribution to my personal development. And I also believe that this is an excellent illustration of inculcating culture of service. I was in my foundational years as a young employee, and with the short spell of, within a short spell of two years, I can state without hesitation that the lessons I learned from Mr. Karimzo had an impact on my career growth and on whatever I have achieved in the process. He provided space for me to learn. He would explain that since he had dictated enough sample letters and other forms of communication, I should be able to draft the rest. On one of two occasions during dictation, I would point out one or two words. I say, oh, those are new words. I don't know the mean. I'm not sure of the meaning. Then he would retort jokingly, did you not tell me you went to Gayaza High School? Find out. Then he would stop there. Within a very short time, therefore, I was able to save him a lot of time, which he could have spent otherwise meeting staff. And uh, I would provide, I could, pro I could provide answers to staff, answer queries, I would draft letters, Sometimes, even before he reads the letter, I would know what he would say, and I would draft the reply and put it on his table. His training helped me later when I had work to, to work with other vice chancellors. At one time, I had the task of drafting many letters for departing staff of, staff of Asian origin and the British expatriates during the time of the exodus from Makerere. They, they said, they, uh, we had to, say, to write many letters. They needed them where they were going when they were sent away from Uganda suddenly. And I knew many of them, so I would add uh, some details about their, their contribution to Makerere University. That was after Mr. Karimzo. It was in the... I was now working with Professor Wandira. So Professor Wandira appreciated this work with this, this statement, Joy, I hope that when I'm leaving Makere University, you'll, have, you'll be in a position to compose such a letter about me. This training earned me so many free beers at the senior staff club. Some were members of staff who thought I had served them well. Others were acting vice chancellors who I could work with in the absence of the vice chancellor. I remember Professor Rutwama, whenever he saw me in the senior staff club, he said, Joey, you is my work. Any drink you want, please, I will pay. I don't know whether it was wise to take all those drinks, but. That, that was appreciation. <laughs> All this apparent efficiency was, of course, mainly because of the grounding I had had under the tutelage of Mr. Karimuzo. <laughs> not all this was, not all was a sales through, however. Some members of staff would leave office reluctantly, and within the corridors, there are always comments 
That woman thinks she's the vice chancellor. <laughs> mm. Mm. Mr. Mr. Karimuzo taught me how to deal with high level, if not top level personalities. He particularly gave me tips on how to handle myself at State House. Mrs. Kaya Min, who had been my classmate at Gayaza High School, I give this example, uh, had organized the luncheon to say goodbye to our headmistress who was retiring, the late John Cox. I was aware about this trip because there had just been a radio statement that the President Idamin was complaining because Makere University was employing a Rwandan national as vice chancellor. Mr. Karimuzo encouraged me to attend the luncheon. He said, he said that it would be good exposure for me. I had to observe table manners. I, de I didn't have that problem. Those were lessons of Ms. Cox at Gayaza. And to talk when necessary, that's what he told me. Fortunately, I was not asked about the vice chancellor. And there was no need for me to say much since our former teachers found appropriate conversation, including the admiration of the president's Scottish tweed jacket. I gave, I gave feedback and that was there. So this was the kind of person who would build up, build up the employee to a certain level. So I, I think I've given enough to show how, in a short time, Mr. Karimzo managed as a manager and as a developer of, of, of human resource in Makere University, and also really taking the charge of the university. So I'd like now to talk about his legacy. And I, I thought I should emphasize this because as people, as the family said it, and many people don't know about Mr. Kalimuzo. I want to start this by emphasizing that the contribution to an institution cannot and should not be assessed through tangible results only. Yes, indeed, infrastructure and other resources are important. However, Mr. Kalimuzo's role comes out clearly as that of bringing about a new dispensation and ushering in the institution a new era. I look at this from the benefit of Makere University, but also from the perspective of the state. He indeed achieved this despite the short spell he, he was at Makere, and I want to, to list this, this legacy. One, bridging the gap between the university and the state. I, I think that is very important to remember there was a gap where I spent a lot of time mentioning this, uh, describing the gap. I will argue that Mr. Karimzo was the right choice for managing the change from dependency to bringing it to a national institution. This can be deduced from the descriptions I've already provided uh, because the change was from the perspective of the state and Uganda, the change was needed. Makere, from the institutional perspective, Makere thought this was the beginning of state interference, as Professor Sebuf mentions in his book. However, I wish to assert that there is no such a thing as full or complete academic freedom. Accountability calls for transparent processes. The state which provides the resources and is responsible for the general educational direction must necessarily have a stake in such institutions. We should not completely dismiss the saying that he who pays the piper chooses the tune. So what is important, I think, to me is to bring the balance between 
the state and the university and to nurture cordial relationships. So he bridged this gap or started the bridging of the, the gap. Secondly, Mr. Karimzo opened up Makere University to the wider Ugandan society. Previously, it was a closed society of people living together practically in an ivory tower, socializing with the univers within university premises, producing plays, staging dances within the campus. The late Karimzo opened up entry into the uh, centers of power such as the Kampala Club, where national issues would be discussed and strategic networks built. The third legacy is the opening up of society, opening up to society, which did not just go to social, I mean social interactions only that I've talked about. Kayumzo Asha Dean the widening of access to university education as opposed to restricted college provisions of 1960s and, and 50s. One recall, recalls the fact that Makere University was then called Makere University Kampala. And I think the aim was to have other Makere University, whether Soroti or Guru, because of the change, not to have just Makere as a small unit here where only a few could go. So there was this change from that philosophy of elitism and inclusiveness, or exclusion rather. So there was this change of mindset that he introduced. This, the first legacy I, I would point out is that he ushered in an era of new forms of student politics. In particular, the state and the ruling party, the Uganda Post Congress then, took interest in student politics and vice versa. In his book, Professor Sebufo actually complains that students were attending rallies up country and that kind of thing. But remember, there was a need to build a philosophy that is common to the state and the university. And I think this allowance of allowing students to participate in politics in the wider community is a very important one. In fact, uh, I had uh, one classmate who when I had practicals, when I was doing ge geography, he said, but how can they put a practical class when they know that uh, Dr. Bote is talking in the parliament in the afternoon? For me, I want to do the practical class. <laughs> the students would go to parliament to listen. He said, I'll be in the garage, I want to do this class. So there was this change of opening up, but you see this is now making the institution become Uganda, and I think that's what I'm trying to, to emphasize. Because we are aware that students can effectively cause change, and political leaders actually need these, these students. Second, we must also recall that before the, that period, my career was still too enclosed for that kind of exchange. And therefore, student community became, it was a captive audience, but it was a new era, and I think this is a very important era which changed the, the life of Makere University and opened it up to Uganda. Mr. Karimuzo demystified, this is my fifth point on the legacy, he demystified the belief that only people in the academy can provide effective leadership of a university because he, has, he had not been in the academy. Within a short time, he had illustrated that the lie in that myth so well that after his disappearance, Oxford University put in place a scholarship fund in his memory. And so I ask, would this be so if he had not been a performer? The sixth legacy 
that Frank Karimzo illustrates is how managers and leaders can turn around resistance and build bridges amicably to work with those who initially were opposed to them. I explained a lot of this at the beginning. I won't go over it, but he excelled in getting to know his environment and work with the people. In the seventh area, he contributed to the production of better human resource. I've already mentioned mentorship and counseling. There were issues like, like compassionate leave, which had not been practiced at Makere University, introduced those cause of being a responsive leader. I mentioned as number eight, the introduction of new academic programs. The chairperson of the council has read them. I, I got this from actually the website. In his brief tenure, commerce, forestry, law, technology, uh, and technology disciplines were added, and veterinary medicine. Uh, all this and music, dance, and drama. This is because some of these vet, for example, was in Nairobi and they were not allowed to start it until the university became independent. So within a short time, he actually introduced those, but we need to emphasize that his tenure was so short, really we can't measure him just by the introduction of programs. In all he did, he demonstrated confidence. This is my nice point here. And this is a lesson about inculcating uh, leadership and bravery and firmness. He did not just follow the government route blind, although he was a government appointee. For instance, one minister, not the one present here, <laughs> of education, decided to promote two professors without asking anybody in the university. Because uh, uh, ministers were supposed to promote professors but with a, a submission from the university. But the minister just promoted two professors they, without the university being aware. And pro, uh, Mr. Karimzo could not keep quiet. He wrote, to the minister advising him to consult and, and pointing out that he was actually putting himself in a bad light because those two people were not professorial material. So unfortunately, it is this confidence and bravery that led to his disappearance because people came to warn him several times, uh, why don't you leave? And uh, Mrs. Karims always explained to me how people would come and talk, I can give you a lift, I can help you, please leave. He said, no, I haven't done anything wrong, and I don't see why I should go to exile. And I recall at one time after President Amin had said he was from Rwanda, not Uganda. He spent a long time, I don't have those, those details because of we were using typewriters, not computers. He listed his lineage to many generations to convince President Amin that he's actually from Iksoro, not Rwanda. But of course that did not save him. I want to, if you give me time, I know I've talk, taken long. I want, since this is a hundred years celebrations, let me also briefly tra pay tribute to a few other leaders under whom I worked so that I can wind up this, this, this presentation. Because I, I gained a lot from them and they built careers of myself and other people. When I started work, I served under Professor Kenneth Baker. He had been my geography teacher and he was briefly posted in the registrar's department to complete his contract. I learned from him timekeeping, but particularly punctuation, he was so particular about punctuation all the time. I would put a comma there, 
things like that. He taught me all that. I learned being careful and made from the meticulous Dan Okunga, who was a deputy registrar. He would weigh his words before speaking, and I learned on how not to speak carelessly. In the Ugandan language, we say to speak for. <laughs> I learned from the versatile Bana Donyango report writing in particular. But I think in remembering of him, this today's theme, one can confidently say that Mr. Donyango demonstrated cordial relationships among staff. He got on with anybody and everybody. I learned from Professor Savia Wandira. I strengthened my English skills. Those of you who knew Professor Wandira, he actually had good English skills. I gathered lessons on diplomatic language from him. But I have to confess, I haven't really achieved that. <laughs> She's still hard for me, but uh, I learned a lot from him. And uh, just to illustrate this diplomacy, one time the, the President Amin brought, uh, invited Colonel Gaddafi to give a, a public talk at Makere University. And we're in the science code rung there. And uh, so, uh, the, the also President Amin had invited the public, people in the city, to come and, and attend this, perhaps in fear that the, there might be not enough audience. So, <laughs> so Professor Wandira, I think having very little to say. I recall that difficult time. So he, he, he thanked the president because the president had said he was going to introduce the faculty of rev revolution. So Professor Wandira's vice chancellor thanked the, H is the president for bringing the first lecturer on revolution. That was Colonel Gaddafi because he was going to address the congregation. He, he, he also expressed appreciation to the president because as he stated, for the first time in the history of Makerere, the president had made it possible for the towns and the gowns to meet on campus. Uh, and that helped to, to, to ease a few things about the tension about uh, Colonel Gaddafi's presence here and President Amin's presence here. I learned uh, minute writing, managing uh, meetings from uh, the efficient Gashom Eyoko. I would write, there we, those days, Senate minutes would be, I don't know whether they still are to Makere, they would go over 100 typed pages. These are Senate minutes. I learned from those the, that how to be meticulous on those issues. As a faculty administrator, I learned a lot from uh, Professor Lutaro Bosa, he was my dean in science. And when I give bust, when I gave bus to twins, he literally did my work. He would say, you are busy, go and work, I will help these people. Uh, uh, and I thank him. I recall with joy the late Apollo Sibambi singing to Kutendere Zayesu along the corridors of the Faculty of Social Sciences whenever he was happy. He was our dean and it was a good lesson in creating a cheerful working environment. Mm. And Professor Mamudani, I was also a faculty administrator, he actually taught us all of us research methods. He would invite us to Center for Basic Research. You need to have these skills. So you can see Makere University 
actually built to meet what it was among others. And uh, I would, we need to thank all these people. But I'm sure that you have noted that all these were men. There was no woman at that rank. All in all, I'm grateful for the opportunity I was given to serve and grow at Makere University, and I wish Makere University many more hundreds of years of excellence. Mm. So I request to say the last word. I wish to thank Makere University once again for putting in place this series of lectures to pay tribute to its leadership and for inviting me to be part of the process. I thank Mrs. Karimuzo in particular for the respect she has accorded to me over time. We have been meeting from time to time. When she heard that I had moved to Kabari University, she invited me to collect Mr. Karimuzo's rich collection of books and uh, in now Kabari University Library. <clears throat> She always pointed out that I saved the books, I might well put them to use where I work. I highly commend Mrs. Kalimzo for her resilience in raising her family, whose father departed when they were at a tender age. Thank you. I thank all of you for listening. Let's continue to build for the future. May the soul of Mr. Frank Karimzo rest in eternal peace for God and my country. Wow, thank you very much. Professor Joy Kwesiga, that was very articulate and humorous and lots of lessons for all of us. We thank you very much. While you were at it, we were joined by Justice Mike Chibita of the Supreme Court and former DPP. Justice Mike Chibita, you're most welcome. Please wave. Yes, there you are. I also recognize the presence of Professor Paul Mugambi, uh, the Executive Director of Vice Chancellor's Forum. Yes, and your dear wife. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm told there's a very big uh, group of students from the Chigezi student community at Makere University. Chigezi, where are you? What do you, what do you say in Chigezi to show that you're here? What do you, what do you say? What is your like, slogan? There's nothing. Who is your leader? Kenneth, what do you say? What's your? Mob, I, want, I want them to, 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 to respond to you so that the audience feels their impact. Thank you for mobilizing them. All right, thank you very much. Yes, right now uh, we are going into a panel discussion. It's going to be moderated by Professor Sarah Sali. I call upon you, Prof. Uh, to call the other panelists. Professor Sarah Sali is an associate professor and dean, School of Women and Gender Studies, and the director, Center of Excellence in Notions of Identity at Macquarie University. She's a social scientist with a PhD in International Health Studies, a master's in Gender Studies, a bachelor's in Social Sciences, particularly Political Science. She is an experienced teacher and researcher, publishing in the area of gender politics gender, politics, and health systems. She chairs a number of several bodies at international, national, university, and community levels. Prominently, she's a member of the Macquarie University Council, where she is chair, quality assurance, member, appointments board. She has been uh, receiving a lot of queries as member appointments board recently, and audit committee. She's also a member of the University Senate, Uganda Institute of Bankers, member of the expert scientific group of the Impala Lung Health Consortium, that is Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and member of several advisory bodies. She's passionate about gender, ethics, Afrocentricism, and African identities, and how these can be leveraged 
to advance African societies. Professor Sarah Sali, you're most welcome to take the panel on. Uh, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. We are very honored, personally, I'm very honored to be here on this great occasion to live through the memory of such a great icon. Mama Esther Karimuzo, we really appreciate that this could be done and we thank the whole family. Right now I have a daunting task to introduce two of Makere's best and two of Uganda's finest. And uh, given all the people who have been here, I don't think I was even the right person to introduce them, but I'm going to try and do this task. Our first distinguished panelist has a very long CV because he's a very important person. And he's none other than the Prime Minister Emeritus of the Republic of Uganda. Dr. Ruhakana Rugunda worked as a physician in various countries, namely Zambia, Washington, D.C., Kenya, Namibia, and Sweden. He's a professional physician, carrying with him a wealth of medical experience spanning 10 years from 1975 to 1985, within which he published several papers. His political career started as a president of the National Union of Students of Uganda. Can we see the students in the house? The presidents and the excellences and all that. You know these days when a guild president leads a delegation to the vice chancellor's office, they come out feeling very great because they set a number of ultimatums and the vice chancellors quake sometimes because a strike is not wanted. We have four or five vice chancellors in the house. So I just want to assure the student leaders that even with your power and might, you will have to do a lot to fit in the shoes of the leader of NUSU at the time. Because NUSU was not just a small thing. NUSU was a national thing. And you heard from the previous speaker how even as a NUSU leader in the university, he was able to cause change in St. Leo's. So he was a president of the National Union of Students of Uganda, NUSU, a political youth movement from 1970 to 71. And at that time, I think it was one of the most effective oppositions in this country. From 1979 until I think two years ago, he has been a member of cabinet, of course disrupted with a few years of exile, but he has served in several dockets in the government under different presidents, whether you're talking about health, works and transport, communications, foreign affairs, information, Minister of Water and Lands and Environment, and lastly, Minister of Internal Affairs. He also served as a chairman of the NRM Electoral Commission, as a member of parliament, and as a, as a president of the governing council of the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP. From January 2009 to 2011, he was appointed Uganda's permanent representative to the United Nations, and he also held the seat at the UN Security Council. So you can see if you're a very good student leader, how far that can take you. In two, May 2011, he was instead appointed a Minister of Information. Two years later, he was appointed Minister of Health. I think we covered this. The Right Honorable Hakana Rugunda was sworn in as the Prime Minister of the Republic of Uganda by His Excellency President Yoweri Kagutam Seven on 2nd October 2014 becoming the 10th person to hold the office since the country achieved independence in 1962. He, is the lead, he was the leader of government business then, and I, I would like to welcome you, Right Honorable Prime Minister Emeritus. Yes. And as he comes, you all heard that he was mentored by our great icon and the person we are celebrating today, so we hope that the vice chancellors in the house can also mentor 
your guild presidents and your student leaders to achieve such stature as the Right Honorable Prime Minister Emeritus. Welcome. Our second distinguished panelist is Professor Edward Rugumayo, who is a Chancellor Mountains of the Moon University. Professor Rugumayo is also an author, an academic, and an environmentalist. Professor Edward Rugumayo is a Ugandan politician, diplomat, botanist, environmentalist, currently serving as Chancellor. He joined government in 1971 after a ministerial appointment that came during his tenure as Makere University Mitchell Hall Warden. Wardens in the house, things can happen. You can come from being a warden to being a minister. In 1973, he resigned from cabinet and fled into exile, where he was an associate professor at the University of Zambia. He participated in the historical Moshi Conference as a senior member of the Uganda National Liberation Front in 1978 and came back to Uganda. Political science lecturers here, I hope you still teach people about the importance of this Moshi Conference. In 1979, he served as the chairman of the National Consultative Council, which was the legislative body of government at the time until May 1980. This appointment meant that he was the first native speaker of the Ugandan parliament. <laughs> Professor Rugumayo has made significant contributions at a global level as an environmentalist. He is also a senior consultant to the United Nations and the World Bank on environmental training and project design. He chaired a 12-person team of consultants hired to establish the School of Environmental Studies at Moy University in Kenya in 1989, and was later a visiting professor at the same institution as well as to several other universities. In 1995, he was appointed Uganda's first ambassador to South Africa until 1999, when he was redeployed as the Minister of Internal Affairs. He was then appointed as the Minister of Tourism, Trade and Industry until his retirement from public service in 2005. On April 3, 2017, he retired as a chancellor of Kampala University after serving for 18 years and is currently serving as chancellor, Mountains of the Moon. You're very welcome, Professor Edward Rugumayo, to take your seat. Can we give a very sounding applause to our distinguished panel? We are here to celebrate Mr. Frank Kalimozo, our first Vice Chancellor. And we've talked a lot about memorizing, but as academics of the time, we are talking about historicizing. Professor Joy Kwesiga did a great job locating the events of the time and of his appointment and of his service within the historical context of the time. And we are going to spend this time trying to see what we can borrow from there and bring into our current context. Our distinguished panelists, you all knew the man. Who was this man beyond the tragedy? A lot of people have spoken, but we want a few highlights from you in a few minutes. Who was Mr. Frank Karimazo to you? Uh, thank you, Chairperson, the university leadership, Esther Kalimzo and the family of Frank Kalimzo, uh, uh, students, friends. I must straight away thank Makere for making it possible to properly recognize Frank Kalimzo for his enormous contribution. <laughs> Who was Frank Kalimzo? A lot has been said. Suffice it to say that he was born in Iksoro, 
now uh, Kisoro district. At that time, uh, Kisoro was part of Kigezi district. And he studied in Kisoro at Sesemi, Kigezi High School, Nyakasura, uh, King's College Budo, uh, Makerere, and then a number of British universities. After his studies, he came back, and Esther Kalimuzo gave us uh, the highlights of his deployment in Uganda, especially when he was in Ankole as the ADC and in Kitugum, and how he took over the responsibility of the Africanization agenda after independence. Frank Kalimuzo, therefore, was one of the key pillars of independence for Uganda. He was responsible for recruiting Africans to replace Bazungu as independence came. One of the critical areas actually that he played a role was being secretary of the World Committee. World Committee can be said to have been the Constitutional Commission at that particular time. This was 1959. He did this job, and the outcome of this committee and this report were significant for the independence of Uganda, promoting Africanization in the service and also making sure that LEGICO, the Legislative Council at that time, had a majority of Ugandans or Africans. No wonder, after independence, he straight away rose to be permanent secretary office of the prime minister then, head of the civil service, and also uh, secretary to the cabinet. He served the service for quite a long time and very well too until his appointment at Makerere University, as we have heard from Professor Kwesiga. Professor Kwesiga did make reference that I was summoned uh, from Fort Potro uh, to come and meet the Vice Chancellor. It is true, I confirm. Uh, we had an active student movement, the National Union of Students of Uganda, and our duty was to mobilize students in all post-primary institutions and all tertiary institutions. Some of the head teachers, most of whom were expatriate uh, head teachers, were fatally afraid of student organizations. So it is true that uh, when we went to St. Leo's and addressed the students, the headmaster then was not extremely comfortable. I think he was called Brother Jones or somebody. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. I'm glad we have uh, some uh, OBs of uh, St. Leo's. Thank you, Justice Tabalo. He has given us the facts. So uh, I was told to come. I came, and uh, Joy was in the office as secretary to the vice chancellor. I met the vice chancellor. He actually told me two points. One, that there were complaints from the headmaster of St. Leo's and that we should create peace instead of confrontation. Number two, he told me he has received information that Idi Amin is looking for student leaders and he has reported to cabinet that these student leaders are not available. They are not at Makere, where are they? they must have joined guerrillas in Tanzania. So, Kalimzo said, be careful, 
take a low profile. He gave me transport back to Fort Potro, and uh, I tried to be as careful as possible, but it was a difficult situation. He actually did his best to save uh, me and my colleagues, student leaders, from either detention or death. Unfortunately, unfortunately, about a month or two after he had given me a warning, told me to be careful, and told me that we are being hunted by the regime, Frank Alimzo was gone. At the beginning of October, I think October 4th, he, before he was taken, as we have heard again from Joy and other speakers, uh, he advised many people who were in danger to be able to take cover or to run out of the country. But it's also true that he was himself advised, again, as you have heard, but he was so convinced about his innocence that he didn't see any reason why he should run away uh, from his country. The last few comments I want to make uh, the lessons from uh, Kalimuzo. Really, Professor Kwesig has very ably articulated them. I may add one or two. The point I want to add is the importance of education. This somebody in the 40s or 30s to come from Kisoro, go through the different educational institutions in the country, go and shine academically in the British universities, come and play a critical role in the building of our country, preparing the country for independence, and guide the Africanization program for Uganda and the head of the civil service, the civil service at that time, when Karimuzo was the head, was reputed to be the best civil service in Africa. So it highlights the importance of education, that education unleashes and releases your potential. You may be in Iksoro, you may be in Kotido, you may be in Chagwe, you may remain there if you are not receiving education. But when you get education, you get liberated. Your energies, your intellect, your potential uh, gets developed. And Kalimuzo gives us a very good example of how his energies, his intellect, his potential was liberated to serve uh, our country. The additional point I want to give is that of the university and society. A university cannot be peaceful, cannot make progress, unless the country, the environment is appropriate. Kalimzo came to Makerere, but the country soon was in turmoil. And when the country was in turmoil, Makerere got affected. And not only affected, but affected badly, including the loss of the vice chancellor. Therefore, the additional lesson we should learn from this is to ensure that the university is part of society, the university educates, does research to serve society, and when society or the country is in trouble, the university cannot remain immune. It will also be uh, affected. The perhaps third point that I would want to make uh, as a lesson is that 
we don't, we have not been knowing really how the transition from colonialism to independence was actualized. It is clear to me that Frank Kalimuzo was at the center stage. At the center stage because he literally guided the political direction of the country by being the secretary of the World Commission, World Report. And this commission had a limited number of Africans, there were I think about 10 or 12. One of them on this commission was Milton Obote who became the president of Uganda subsequently. So Karimzo guided the politics, but he also guided the civil service. As we had said, he was in charge of establishment. Establishment meaning recruitment, training, transfers, promotions, and related issues. So you are holding the political angle and also the civil service angle. And this is where the country uh, rests. Therefore, Kalimbo Rizzo had the unique responsibility, unique opportunity to be able to wield the political and civil service authority and use it well to guide the country to independence. I therefore think we have a lot to learn from uh, his life, his work. I'm glad that uh, Joy has uh, kept a lot of the literature about uh, Kalimuzo and what he used to have uh, in his library. We need to learn more from this. As I conclude, I want to thank Makere once again for bringing this day to fruition. I was reflecting that perhaps it is better that Kalimuzo was not recognized earlier. Because if he was recognized earlier, he would have perhaps not been recognized to the extent that he deserves, as has been demonstrated today. <laughs> this historic memento memorizing Kalimuzo is a great achievement for Makerere, and I thank you. I also want to thank Esther and your children for being able, one, to support Kalimuzo in his earlier days, number two, for you being able to keep the children and ensure that they get their proper education. Esther Kalimzo did exactly what Frank Kalimzo would have wanted. And we are glad that the young ones, some of them are here, and they are doing uh, very, very, very well. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a memorable day. Let's celebrate the life of Kalimzo. Let's learn more about Kalimzo. He is, in my view, a living example of Ugandans to be emulated. I thank you. Thank you very much, Right Honorable. There are still more questions coming for you, so it's not conclusions yet. Professor Rugumayo, in brief, who was this man to you beyond the tragedy? And those who have questions to our distinguished panel, please write them down and send them. They will address them from here due to time. Professor Rugumayo. Thank you very much. First of all, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to thank the Vice Chancellor, Professor Banawas Nawangwe, for inviting me to this very historic meeting in remembrance of our departed friend, Frank Kalimuzo. I would also like to thank Esther Kalimuzo. Whenever we used to meet at the, at the church, we remembered many things without mentioning them. 
Thank you very much, Esther. I'm sure you're one of the few people who remembered me to be on this committee. And of course, my good Ndugu Rohakana Rugunda, a stubborn student, <laughs> who later on I'll tell you <clears throat> how we wrestled a lot with him. And um, all the other things. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, your, your air con has dried my throat. <clears throat> no, it doesn't matter. Now, who was Frank Kalimazov? You see, many of us have been educated in Britain. Frank was educated in Britain. But he has the base and foundation in Uganda. At Nyakasura, Budo, and here. He learned two things from the British. Discipline and management. He learned nothing about class feeling of the British. I hope you understand this issue. When you are trained in Britain, you have a class feeling. Because Britain is a very class society. But he didn't. So he was able, when he came back, not to act as someone in an ivory tower, but someone right to the ground level. And that really was his strongest point, to be able to excite students, including those who had organized the demonstration against him. He was a first-class speaker, no phrase-mongering, no complicated words. He spoke straight to the heart of the audience. I'm one of the beneficiaries of his talent. Some time back, I worked in the office of the president. And this is where I met our president of Seveni. <clears throat> I wrote something that was true, but not liked by the president. One night, I was summoned with late Picho Ali, remember? To go and meet the president in his office, parliament buildings. This was midnight. Picho Ali and I sat there trembling. The chief of general service, what was his name? Kenya Adoko, an old boy of Nyakasura, he said, do you know Rugumayo? He said, no, sir, I don't know. That what you have written can land you at Ruzira, I almost had a heart attack <laughs> at a young age. But who was in that room? Inspector General Police and Frank Kalimuzo as Secretary to Cabinet. After long deliberations, I'll cut the long story short. He said, oh, these are young people, Mr. President. They're still hot. You just, just forgive them. So 
we were waiting for something else to be said. Then the, we were dismissed. I want you to listen to this carefully. So the president says, Rugumayo, said your excellency, let's see how you use, you use power when you get it. Now, the following day, no, the following Monday, I got a letter transferring me from office of the president written by Frank Kalimuzo, head of civil service, secretary to cabinet, to the Ministry of Education and senior inspector of schools in charge of science. <laughs> from that day on, we became very close friends. Of course, I know him earlier. Then, as, as fortune would have it, I become warden of Mitchell Hall. He's the vice chancellor. We work together very closely. Then, suddenly, one day at 5 o'clock p.m., I, I am announced as Assistant Minister of Education. The following day, a Benz with a bodyguard arrives at 7 o'clock. I go straight to State House, to Parliament Building. I'm sworn in as Minister of State or Assistant Minister education. Frank is here as Vice Chancellor. Now I am his minister. <laughs> that was Uganda. Now what am I driving at here? <clears throat> Frank and I really bonded. Later on, I was appointed full Minister of Education. Then I had to grapple with so many challenges. And one of them these students, <laughs> led by no other than Nusu President <laughs> Ndugu Rohakana Rugunda with his beard which he never shaved. <laughs> so
events have actually run away to Tanzania to join Obota's guerrillas. Are you following? But the current leaders, we told them to go into hiding. <clears throat> he was at uh, Bohinga Hospital. We sent a message to him to come post haste or you'd be in trouble. He arrived, went to Amin's office. Amin told him, oh, he loved him very much, but that he was planning to kill Amin. <laughs> anyway, to cut the long story short, Raguna being the smart man he is, was, had a friend who drove him to Bsembatia. There used to be a train there going to Nairobi, straight to Nairobi. There he met, he knew Professor Nabudere was chairman of East African Railways. He got a taxi which took him there. He didn't even have money. Arrived. Anyway, next time I found him in Zambia. So this was a very difficult time. I will not go over what Esther has ably explained, because <clears throat> that opens up old wounds. But one thing that was terrible, and I say it here now, when Omonia and I had gone to Dar es Salaam to say goodbye to President Obote, <clears throat> This was 1979, March, April. He asked us, no, he asked me direct, had I received his two letters to me? Do you get the point? No, you don't. Had I received his letters, he wrote me the two letters. When I was minister in a minister's government, then he added, please listen carefully. He had written to Bene Kiwanuka, who was chief justice, and also written to Frank Karimuzo. But those letters never arrived. So all those letters were intercepted. The rest you can surmise. Now I'm going through this to know you will pass through a very difficult period. Frank was at the center of this difficult period. He was struggling between government and academia. Professor Joy Kwesig has ably demonstrated to you how difficult it was to bring a top civil servant to academia and be able to endear himself to these academicians. We have passed through a very difficult period as a country. In the process, we lost Frank and many others. 
But all is not lost because they say who, he, he who loves last loves best. When you, we see all of you here commemorating 50 years, what could have been, he would have, perhaps he would have been here. But we are now commemorating with 100 years of this university and 50 years of demise of our dear friend, Frank Kademozo. These are important achievements in the history of this university. <clears throat> and really, to bring a university to be part and parcel of society is the most difficult thing. It is a, a continuous experimentation. Very, very continuous. And Professor Nwangwe and your team, I commend you. Keep on struggling. It will take a long time. And my, our dear Professor Kwesiga at Kabale, I know you call yours a, a, a community university. We are at the Mount of the Moon University. We call ours community university. It's not easy to bring the gown to town <laughs> and vice versa. That dichotomy is going to stay for some time. But gradually, it will slowly dissolve. But today, is, we really can celebrate a life well lived, a life to be emulated, a life to be celebrated, and a life to know that short, for that short life he lived, he was very productive. Very productive. In those two years, he was able to transform this university. Some of us have, you know, in two years, you can't, you find you have done nothing. Am I right? But he was able to transform this institution. I learned a lot from him. The mere, the mere fact that he could read his boss's mind and transfer me from his, the president's office to education three days later showed you his capacity to read the times. Because if we had stayed there, who knows? Would have been a cooler. So these are challenges we have, young people. We all these are handing over the button to you. Learn to serve. Actually, when you serve faithfully, the rewards are not easy to measure. Thank you. The rewards are not just material. Um, when I look at the group down here, these have been servants long time. Thank you very much, Professor. And I congratulate you. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much. Yeah. Now, I say goodbye to you. And um, I've taken too much time, but I think I'm allowed to have the last word. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Rugumayo. You were actually supposed to also have one last thing, and, and you have knocked on, you've touched it a bit, relating to the problematic student community who continues to be a key stakeholder and a key force for university managers to reckon with. In the house, we have five universities represented. So using the lens of the life of, Professor, of, Dr. of Mr. Karimuzo, what is your message to the vice chancellors in the house on how to deal with these students? We have Makere, we have Kabale University, we have Unkumba, we have Bishop Stewart, we have Mountains of the Moon, and we have Uganda Christian University. And they all have student bodies. Professor You see, I have no answer, but I have one or two contributions to make. We are living in a, an age where information is power. We have our students are getting a lot of information, but not processed. It has not been transformed into knowledge. One. Two, they take everything, in quotes, on social media as gospel truth. They're bombarded from left, right, and center by social media every day. Now there's something I want to share with you. This social media carries subliminal messages of sex, of subversion, of rebellion, of idleness where it tells you can become a billionaire within three, four years. And many of our young people believe this. We grew up without these distractions. Our source was perhaps a few books and the teachers. Now, the main, main challenge of a university now is to teach these young students how to manage positively this barrage of information. I don't know how you can do it, but it's possible. Thank you very much. The VCs you have had teach the young students how to manage information. The next question goes to Right Honorable Prime Minister Emeritus. You've heard that our great icon was a, a first of many things, but key, the key thing which stands out in all these firsts is the Africanization problem you have spoken about, Africanization agenda, which really characterized the first decolonization agenda. Currently, the continent is undergoing a second phase of decolonization. Given your experience, and using the lens of Mr. Frank Karimuzo, Give us at least two things the current decolonization process should pay attention to. Thank you. Uh, let me just make one or two comments on the first point. I think the traditional methods and I agree with uh, Edward here, the traditional methods of university administration issues, or for that matter, sorting out issues in the country, remain effective. However, one or two things have changed. If the institutions are right and the regulations are clear, if there is good and a timely communication, and there is a mechanism 
of either meetings or resolution of disputes, things will work. But what has changed is the speed. Because of the point raised by Andrew Grugmayo of improved media communication, especially social media and other forms of media which are extremely fast. Information, especially misinformation, travels very fast and therefore it is essential that in resolving problems we should endeavor to do so as quickly as possible in order to stop damage or wrong information continuing to spread in the public and to become the norm. With regard to second decolonization, uh, it's uh, not easy to understand what you mean by second decolonization. The decolonization of the to... mind, because the first decolonization was to get the Africans in the spaces that the white man occupied. The second is to undo what entered our minds. So given your experiences, all cabinet, prime minister, UN, Security Council, and as a person who was mentored by Mr. Frank Karimuzo, what do you think we should focus on to clear our mind? Yeah, so when uh, the chair talked about the second, second form of decolonization, I was thinking of struggle against neo-colonialism and imperialism. But you have narrowed it rightly uh, to the issue of not only having Africans, but having Africans doing the right things. Well, really, what a person does at the end of the day depends on many factors that have been put as the base line for decision making. If you are bombarded with inaccurate information, you may end up taking wrong decisions. So it's important to ensure that we use correct sources of information that will enable us to perform better as uh, Africans in a position. It is also true, of course, there are other attractions. Foreign influence, corruption, and sometimes you find our institutions being archaic and unable to respond effectively to the new challenges of the times. Therefore, to answer your point or to respond to your point, I think all of us need to focus on correct information, correct education, and at the same time, ensure that it's a monitoring mechanism. You appoint so and so, a boss, vice chancellor, minister, or something. There is a need for mechanism to ensure that what they are expected to do is actually being done. Therefore, the struggle for second decolonization, as you have defined it, the struggle for true independence is a complex matter which requires multiple inputs and if those inputs are wrong, you get into problems. If you have inputs that are correct, it will help you in decision making. It is like those old days when Frank Karimzo from Xoro came up through various schools and got, in my view, good inputs which enabled him to champion the transition from colonialism to independence and to preside over the best civil service uh, on the continent. So it's a complex issue that benefits 
from many sources of information, activity, and regulations. Thank you very much, our distinguished panel. I think due to time, we are not going to be able to take questions from the public. But in case you have any questions, please write them down and Issa Mugabo will collect them and we shall make sure they are answered. I think due to time, I would like to thank our eminent distinguished panel. We all know where they are. All the organizers will tell us where we can find them. As you can see, they have a wealth of knowledge, which due to time we have not been able to explore deeply. So we still need you. Maybe we shall request the Vice Chancellor to keep bringing them back so that everyone can have more of them, especially the student body with the NUSU president. It will be a great thing. So thank you very much for this great opportunity. Thanks a lot to my distinguished panel. And please, another rousing hand of applause to them. Thank you very much. And maybe as they leave, I would also like to take this moment to recognize Mr. Dida Sinkurunzinza. Please stand up for recognition. <laughs> Mr. Dida Sinkurunzinza was the chairperson of the Makere University Tribunal when I served under him. And one thing he always told us in the decisions we took is think about the health of the institution first. So we were Mwasa activists and we had great agendas there. But he reminded us it was not about our activism. The question was, are you leaving a better institution by the decision you're making as a staff tribunal? Thank you very much, Mr. Didas in Kurunzinza. That message has traveled with me in all the positions I hold. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sarah Sally, for that excellent moderation. Many thanks to our panel once again. Thank you for being an attentive audience. Uh, we have a few items to, to wind up our program. Kindly bear with us, but let's have a breather. We have a very talented uh, gentleman in our midst who will give us uh, what he calls a specially dedicated and composed echevgu. Milton Waviona. Oh, abanya chichesi mure. Heni kevu kati mwana ngwe. Heni kevu kati mwana ngwe. Mwa taza nkaza na demba kati kavula mataji kaza kola nye choko mushe nye navula nko kumbi gamba nko garaka gambi na mawuchi nza. Harata wama kakandu, harata wama kakandu kaya vantum. Hona shimunga rukim. Harata wama kakandu, harata wama kakandu kaya vantum. Harata wama kakandu kanta mazinga na chachanga umuche renka kemero munti gana rgoka na vante. Mzikeza rute ikatuna vantum. Hanya bora gero kya kuruga himangule lokwa lunko tempere gente mena baraka kiwa kya lumlimbo wazala nyer matine ge marajar e makero e e makero e e lumboxo e e afrostonzo e e mislexo e ra cha ha thank you Milton, when we said brief, I didn't think it would be that mini skirt. But thank you very much, Dr. Milton Waviona. Um, may I now call upon our chairperson of council, Mrs. Lona Magara, to give us her remarks. We do recognize the presence of your dear husband, Dr. Magara. Thank you very much for being with us. Our guest of honor, 
Mrs. Esther Kalimzo and members of the family, the Prime Minister Emeritus Republic of Uganda and Special Envoy for Special Duties Office of the President, Right Honorable Hakana Rugunda, Your Excellency the Ambassador of Rwanda to Uganda, the Chancellor Mountains of the Moon University Professor Edward Rugumayo, members of the University Council present, the Vice Chancellor Makere University Professor Banabas Nawangwe and members of the University Management, the several Vice Chancellors of, Bishop, um, of the various universities, Bishop Stewart University, Uganda Christian University and several others, our keynote speaker, the Vice Chancellor, Kabale University Professor Joy Kwesiga. I've never heard you speak, it's such a delight. You're an excellent uh, orator. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I recognize you in your various capacities. I see justices and, and several other distinguished um, members of today's session. It gives me great pleasure as chairperson of council to deliver the concluding remarks at this historic fourth of the Makere at 100 lecture series in honor of our vice, first vice chancellor, the late Frank Kalimzo. What a memorable day this has been. Let me, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, begin by thanking God who has for close to the last 50 years protected Mama Esther and her family since that dark day in 1972 when her husband was escorted out of their home never to be seen again. We are sincerely grateful to God that you, Mama Esther, have lived to see this day and testify of the Almighty's unfailing love. Indeed, today's theme, Remembering Frank Kalimzo, Lessons for Universities in Cultivating a Culture of Excellence and Distinguished Leadership, has allowed us to reflect on the values he passionately exemplified and eventually sacrificed his life for. Thank you, Right Honorable Rugunda and Professor Rugumayo for giving us a different version, a different insight into his life. I was actually thinking as you sat here reflecting that stories so much so that we need to deliberately have a plan to capture them. And I was thinking many in, in the olden days you'd have a fireplace, you'd have uh, the elderly sit around a fireplace and the young people come and sit and hear these stories and that's how um, values and, and truths were passed on from one generation to the other. Right now, I'm not sure we have that kind of, of setting, and so I'm not sure that we are actually transferring truth and values from one generation to the other. I don't know how many of the young people here have even understood the kind of, of wealth of information that has just been shared with us today. And so I'd like to encourage the university. Um, we have the Right Honourable here, a student leader, maybe the students would want to hear from him and have a different perspective to student leadership. So anyway, this is all just to say that let's have those fireplace moments where lessons can transcend from one generation to another. This is truly a rare opportunity and today as we reflect on the values uh, of the late Frank Kalimzo that he passionately exemplified and eventually sacrificed his life for. Like a faithful martyr, he maintained his innocence, refusing to abandon his post, despite the grave danger it posed to his life. This rare display of steadfastness is one we each ought to reflect on when we face hardships in the daily pursuit of our missions. Thank you, Professor Joy Kwesiga, for accepting to deliver today's keynote address, which has given us fresh insights into the life and values of the late Frank Kalimzo. We could not have chosen a better keynote speaker. Thank you.
Equally humbling has been the sacrifice of time and resources by our eminent panelists, the Right Reverend Honorable Rugunda and Professor Emeritus Edward Rugumayo, to grace this lecture and contribute to today's rich discussion. I thank our moderator, Associate Professor Sarah Sali, for expertly guiding our panelists to share their personal experiences and nuggets of wisdom. As Makere University celebrates our 100th anniversary, lectures such as today's are a strong statement by the University Council that we have not forgotten the men and women that made significant contributions to who we are today as an institution. Their sacrifices and services are commemorated through acts such as naming our Central Teaching Facility One, the Frank Kalimzo Central Teaching Facility. Indeed, many who will walk past and drive past the Frank Kalimzo Central Teaching Facility shall be reminded of his great legacy. And those who do not know him will curiously be drawn to seek it out, to seek out this information. This naming gesture is the least we could do to perpetuate the distinguished legacy of the late Frank Kalimzo, the first Vice Chancellor of Macquarie University. Therefore, I thank the Vice Chancellor members of management, faculty, and staff for your excellent work in planning and coordinating this important event. Thank you. As we celebrate 100 years of nurturing world-class leaders, we are proud to bring to remembrance and celebrate the lives of those who built for the future. We nevertheless remain cognizant that they would not have excelled in their professional careers without the untiring support of their spouses and family. These celebrations are therefore also an opportunity to celebrate the families of these distinguished personalities. On a personal note, my friendship with Mama Esther, fondly known as Auntie Esther Kalimzo, goes back to my university days when she opened her home to us, to many of us. Auntie Esther, opened her home to many young people in the university at the time. It was a place to hang out on a Sunday afternoon after a church service. I'm not sure how she managed this. We were so many, but she fed all of us. <laughs> we ended up in her kitchen in every room in the house eating everything in sight. You can imagine university students just landing on your house after a Sunday afternoon, in the, on a Sunday afternoon. Whatever food, and somehow I think she'd be ready for us because there was so much food all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Esther, for pro Auntie Esther, for providing a home for so many of us. On an interesting note, I think many relationships were nurtured in that home as well, later to become husband and wife. Thank you for, for opening your home to many of us, for being a mother, for nurturing us, for counseling us, and for being the tough eye many times. We had a, a uh, there's a name we always called her, Afande, because not only was she loving, but she was also very tough. Thank you, Auntie Esther. These celebrations are therefore also about you. We celebrate you. I know I speak for many here and several online who would have loved to be here but who are not here with us today. On the 6th of May, we held the third of the Makere at 100 lecture series in honor of the late Katikiro Martin Luther and Sibira. During that lecture, Honorable Roda Kalema, a great friend of Mama Esther Kalimzo, paid a moving tribute to her late father. This year-long celebration of Macquarie University's 100th anniversary is therefore a true homecoming for alumni, friends, and families of those who have gone through the gates of this great institution. I therefore take this opportunity as the chairperson of council to invite all of you to visit our centenary website, whose address is on the various branding materials around this room, for various accounts of activities we have held over the last 100 years. 
As you browse through those, that website, I pray that you'll be inspired to share your own story with, about Makere with our secretariat, or better still, make a donation as we continue leveraging 100 years of excellence in building a transformed society. We want to use this year-long celebration to make some impact on this university, whether it's in, in renovations or putting up new structures or student, whatever it is that will make the next 100 years better for those currently here or those that will come in the years ahead. So thank you all for sparing your time to join us today at the fourth of the Makere at 100 lecture series in honor of the late Frank Kalim. So God bless you and have a great day. In closing, we're going to take uh, some photos and I'd like um, to be guided on how this will take place. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, um, may I request the team that is going to help take off the seats, quickly do that. We shall have uh, six photos and I request you as chairperson council to remain there. Now, some photos will be taken up and others uh, we shall have a few down to, uh, with uh, Madame Esther Kalimzo. Um, the first one, I'm going to request members of the panel, the members of the panel are still here, to be joined uh, by the Vice Chancellor and members of Council present, the Chair, Organizing Committee, um, the, the keynote speaker, Performing Arts, you'll kindly hold on, kindly hold on. Yes, let's first have the photo session and then we shall close with you. All right. Uh, Professor Joy Kwesiga, the members of the family uh, who can come up here, Felis. Daniel. Yes. Yes, you will represent. Uh, unfortunately, the space does not allow us to have a proper photo down if we are to capture the branding, that is why uh, we are going to do it up here. So, yes. Where is the Vice Chancellor? The university secretary, is he still with us? All right, that is... Um, uh, well, is that the proper order? Does the chairperson council stand that far? I think she should be somewhere in the middle, uh, maybe close to a member of the family who is representing... Okay. Yes, the DVCs. Thank you very much. Is the photo too wide? Should they curve a bit? Ah well, I seek guidance. The photographer, who is the official photographer? No, no, students, first step aside, kindly. I'm going to call you, just, just a little, don't you worry. I'm going to call you, just take a seat there. Hmm? Member of council, my apologies. Because of, uh, my apologies. Hmm? Two members of council still, Bruce and, and KJ. Okay. Will you come? There is space. You see this? The photographer has not complained. It's too wide. I was asking you, so should they carve in a bit? Kindly carve in a bit, I think, from, from this point, the student here. They want to carve in a bit. And uh, Mr. Magara, Dr. Magara. Would you kindly stand in your right place? All right, so that is our first photo. Um, smile. 
let us remember Kalimzo with a smile in the photos. All right, the second photo, uh, other members of council who did not come and senior management, please. But uh, there are people who should stay, of course, uh, chairperson council, you remain, vice VC, you stay. And I'm told Dr. Magara stays by default. <laughs> yes, so other members of senior management, right, Honorable Prime Minister, kindly stay. Kindly stay. Yes, you will stay for all the photos. Yes, you will. Yes. All right. Uh, other members of senior management, please. Principals and deputy principals, I saw Professor Ahichire, Josephine, I saw other principals. Let's do this quickly. Thank you very much. I see Professor Buyinza, I see the Dean of Students. Hmm? We are not yet, wait, photographers, uh, they are still coming. Are we all here? I see uh, Dr. Helen Biamjisha, uh, Dr. He the senior librarian. Okay, she, okay, okay. Uh, I saw Paul Agaba, PDD. Okay. All right, so that's our second photo. Thank you very much. We shall have the third one. Again, the team that had stayed, stayed, please stay. Now the third one is other vice chancellors present. Thank you for joining us. And uh, other professors. Ambassadors in attendance, um, the, the executive director, UNRWA, yes, uh, let us join this photo. Thank you. Uh, okay. The chair of the tribunal, yes, please. Yes, yes. Did I miss anyone? There is more space, I think, on the other side. Hmm. VC says the ladies should be in the middle. <laughs> yes. Let's wait. There is one more member joining. Let hold it, please. One more person. Uh, yes. Yes, you could stand there. Thank you. All right. All right, that's it. Uh, the fourth. Student representatives, don't feel left out. Thank you for mobilizing. We have our acting uh, student guild. Come, please come back. And then we have the former guild president, Shamim. Uh, Shamim. Shamim made quite a name. Uh, Noop. And then uh, we have Agaba Redeemer. That is uh, from Chigezi School of Education. And other representatives of the student guild. Let's, that's our last photo up here. Then we shall take the ones down. Students, come, come, students, feel free. S students, uh, okay, this is their day. They're very smart, aren't they? Please clap for them. Our students know how to stand out. May I request Issa in the meantime to help me move um, Madame Esther Kalimzo to where she moved initially so that we can take the last few two photos with her from, from the lower section. Issa, let us um, uh, now have the last photos now. Are we done here? Thank you so much. You can go. I will request just a few of you to join. Um, Mrs. Esther Kalimzo and her family. 
First of all, the children and grandchildren who are present, will you please? Yes, will you please stand up? Hmm? Hmm? Yes, we're going to stand here now. Hmm. The children and grandchildren, can we have you? Uh, can we see you? Can we can we remove this this thing? Can it move? Or would that destabilize the sound? There's a cable to eat. Let's first, first have one photo of the family members only. The family members only for our records. These are the children and grandchildren. These are the children and grandchildren. Thank you so much for coming. Try to balance. We are trying to catch the branding in the photography. Uh, so balance out. All right, thank you. Let us uh, leave only Mama Esther Kalimzo and perhaps Phyllis. Phyllis and uh, Paul, I think. Daniel, sorry, Daniel. Uh, and then let us be joined by the Chairperson Council and your dear husband. Let's be joined by Al uh, Madam Allen Kajina in that photo and Ambassador Rutabana. And the Vice Chancellor. And the Vice Chancellor. And the Right Honorable Prime Minister. Is, have they, are they balanced on your branding like you want it to be? I will. Photographer, are they smiling the way you want them to? Yes, yes, please. Hold it, hold it, please. Uh, all right, it's now complete. You may take the photo. The next photo. I request the justices still here present to please join. Justice Mike Chibita. Is he gone? He's gone. All right, the other justices are still present. Please join that photo. And I request that um, thereafter, uh, Issa, you organize for Madam Esther Kalimzo to sign that beautiful art piece that uh, has been drawn by one of our, our own. Wonderful, are we done? Uh, 
Yes, we need to sign, before we sit, Madam Lona and the entire team, we need to sign, uh, it's going to be brought here for the benefit of um, uh, our, our chief guest. Yes, and as, and it's, as, as it's being signed, a quick word or two from Agaba. Agaba, uh, sorry for breaking pro protocol. Agaba helped mobilize students, and he will say a word or two as performing arts and film gets ready to give us the national anth the anthems, and then we are done. Thank you for your patience. Is there any photo we we've denied? Anyone is disgruntled? That laughter means we are covered. Okay, uh, Agaba, keep it brief. We are now signing, and as we sign, let us listen to this young man from Chigezi. Okay, uh, guest of honor for today, Mrs. Esther, uh, our Prime Minister Emeritus, Mr. Rakana Rugunda Nugu, the Chancellor, Professor Edward Rugumao, the Chairperson of the Council, and the Vice Chancellor of Makere University, Mr. Barnabas Nawango, Professor. Vice Chancellor Kabale University, Professor Joy Kweska. The Organizing Committee and the fellow leaders present. I do greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, my name is Redima Gaba, and I am leading organizing of the students for today. And. Uh, Specifically, Kigezi had to take the lead because, as you have all heard, Mr. Frank Alamuzu was from Kigezi, and we as the Kigezi students, students, we saw it necessary to come and be here with us. Again, I would like to thank uh, and recognize the presence of several leaders, for example, our own good president, former, that is Nambasa Shamim, and the other ministers present. I also want to recognize the presence of our patron, Mr. Alexander Chokwijuka, who has spared his time to come and be here with us. Uh, I want to thank the presence of the good clerk. I'd seen her around. Then I would also like to thank and appreciate the presence of the fellow leaders whom I've been working with, organize, and invite students for this event. Uh, Kabal is composed of several districts, including Ka Kaba, sorry, sorry, is composed of very many districts, including Solo, Rukunjiri, Kanungu, Rubanda, among others. I would like to thank the few of the leaders I've been able to work with, and I request them to stand up for recognition. Uh, to conclude, of course, we have, I do believe we have all learned very many lessons from the work of our own Frank Aramzo on what he did towards the nation building. Among the few lessons I've picked, I've learned the fruits of hard work. You have all heard that he was a selfless man, that he could even work very hard. I've also learned about the idea of patriotism and serving your own country. I have learned about helping children. You all heard that he was paying school fees for children whom he was not even the, the dad or the parent, but he was just doing it out of the goodwill. I've learned about nation building, especially after hearing from the inspirational stories from the right honorable Prime Minister Ndugu Rugunda. I've also learned about, more about student governance that after getting involved in student governance, it's when we shall take over, of course. We are the future leaders of tomorrow. We are the future prime ministers of tomorrow. We are the future leaders of tomorrow because it all starts small. Uh, I will not say much, but I would request to, uh, and extend a vote of thanks once again to the organizing committee for putting it into consideration and organizing such events which ensures transmission of how we get to know about the great Makere University and how it started and how it has transformed up to the date. Once again, I remain Redima Gaba. I'm a student of Bachelor of Arts with Education and I'm in my final year. 
I do originate from Kabale and I'm a Muchiga. Otherwise, may the good Lord bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Agaba, for the mobilization you did. And thank you for those uh, kind remarks. Yes, we are winding up, I hope, soon. Uh, we sing the anthems and then uh, we are done. We thank you once again for your patience. We overshot our time but I believe it was worth it. This, such a day does not come often. Isa, please signal to me when you're through. Is this available for other members of the public to initial? Yes, where will it be? It will be put just at the entrance. Again, don't feel denied. Uh, Makere is for all of us. And Professor and the late uh, Frank Kalimzo stood for that kind of diversity. Yes, the rest will sign after we are stepping out. Tivirusia, thank you for that wonderful drawing. Where is he? Where is Tivirusia? Yes, thank you. What, is, uh, what have you drawn today? As the last person signs, tell us what, is, what this is. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a commemorative piece, and we're celebrating the, the legend and uh, what have captured the conversations that have been shared. Maybe highlighting the stories when, when they mentioned about him, his contribution, the state and the university. So I captured that and then I featured the portrait of his face, one of the old famous portraits, and then incorporated in different things that were shared, uh, like the academic freedom, the courage of service, uh, being a neighbor, uh, co uh, uh, inspiring confidence, and the many things about Pan-Africanism. I would want to say it's a collection. It can take a whole day of talking about this piece. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Performing Arts. All right, let's rise for the anthems. Thank you.
thank you performing arts and film that brings us to the close of this event you're welcome to depart let us allow the guest of honor to use the main entrance with her family and other members who are part of the distinguished guests the rest of us there are several exits but also uh, you can feel free to use the same after they have fairly cleared the way thanks again feel at makere we have other events coming up we have an alumni dinner please look out for it and come let's focus again bless you One hundred years ago, men and women who were less advantaged than us today started this great institution. They have built it through the years to make it the great institution that it is, to produce the great men and women that have moved our country, our region, the whole continent and even beyond. They are the ones responsible for making us who we are. We should also make a commitment that if they did what they did, what can we do so that a hundred years later, people can also say, yes, a hundred years ago, some people made Margaret even a greater institution, and it is what has made us what we are. So this is an opportunity for all of us to make that contribution. It is important for transforming our country, for making sure that our children, great-grandchildren, will live a life better than what we have lived. You will be investing in your future. Organize small meetings wherever you are, Makererians, wherever you are around the world, and commemorate your days at Makere University. That is also important because all those activities help in building the spirit of Makere University. So please, I call upon all of you to join us, to celebrate this as we contribute to making the university even greater. Please, you can follow us on our website, www.mac.ac.ug, and there are special pages there dedicated to 100 years celebrations.